Good morning, members. Welcome to this first meeting of Economy and Resources Committee uh, since lockdown commenced uh, many months ago now. Um, this meeting is being live streamed and recorded, and the recording will be made available on the Council website for public listening. Could I remind members uh, attending remotely to follow the good practice guidance, which includes muting microphones and switching off uh, video when you are not addressing the meeting, please? Should you wish to contribute to any item, you should write speak in the Teams chat function, and you will be invited to speak in order uh, about new issues. Should your question or issue be raised by a previous speaker, please withdraw your request so that we can deal with business as efficiently as possible. The usual standing orders apply, including that any votes will be undertaken by roll call. If any member has to leave the meeting uh, for any reason, that is, attending, any member is attending virtually, can I remind you please to either leave the Teams meeting for that period of time, or advise us by writing leave in the Teams chat function, uh, and then join when you are able to rejoin. This will allow us to monitor member presence. We have several important reports to consider today, and I anticipate we will deal with the business in front of us in our usual efficient manner. But before we proceed, I wanted to take time to recognise the contribution of the services within economy and resources in the response to COVID-19. Many of our teams have been redeployed to support emergency response activity and others to deliver business support. Uh, so I welcome the progress that has been maintained throughout that time uh, on important areas of activity, such as the borderlands business cases uh, that we will consider today. Uh, I think we'd all want to record our appreciation uh, to staff for um, their diligence and hard work uh, throughout that period, which I have to say I think has really gone uh, above and beyond the call of duty in many cases. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the Cedarin and apologies. Claire, can you provide the Cedarin, please, and indicate uh, who is participating remotely, uh, as well as any apologies. Thank you, Chair. Currently, I should perhaps first of all say, since the papers were issued, there's been a change in membership of the committee due to a change of proportionality. Uh, Councillor James is no longer on this committee and there is currently a vacancy from the independent group. So currently, uh, we've got two members not present, being Councillor Campbell and Councillor Tate. Uh, we've got a number of members attending via teams being Councillor Drybra, Councillor Carruthers, Fairbairn, Hagman, Ingalls, McClelland, Marshall, Martin and Murray. And for the benefit of everybody else, the attending via teams, the members in the room are also Councillors Justy, Councillor Hislop, Councillor Johnston, Councillor Nicholson, Scoby and Thompson and Wood. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Just uh, to, to record that Councillor Dougie Campbell will be an apology for today's meeting. Um, and I confirm that I approve uh, the participation of those members taking part remotely. Uh, we'll move on to item two, declarations of interest. Uh, I'll invite uh, members to make any, declar any declaration of interest they have uh, in any of the items today. Uh, I'll start uh, on item 10. Uh, uh, for the record, my partner is employed by the Fries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust, uh, which has provided uh, some advice to um, one of the organisations seeking uh, a grant. Um, however, I do not consider that the nature of my interest is such that I require to leave the meeting. In item 11, again, uh, as in item 10, um, the Fries and Galloway Small Communities Housing Trust uh, has been involved in a number of the projects recorded uh, in the appendix. Um, and I am also a member of the Dalbiti Rocks and Wheels Steering Group. However, that appendix is for uh, noting as an update. Uh, therefore, do not consider that uh, the nature of my interest would require me to leave the meeting uh, for that item either. Um, I'm happy to provide you with a note of that if it's uh, useful at the, uh, at the end, Claire. Um, I'll invite uh, any other um, declarations of interest. I see I have uh, Sean Marshall followed by Archie Drybra. Sean, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'd uh, just like to declare an interest in exempt item 16, which is the Borderlands Chap Cross Outline Business Case. I work for the site licence company uh, that's uh, decommissioning at Chapel Cross, but they don't own the site. It's the NDA own the site, so I will be staying in the meeting for that item. Thank you, Sean. Archie? 
Yes, yeah, thanks, Yeah, It's the same item, actually. I am the Chapel Cross uh, site stakeholder group um, chairman, uh, although I do, uh, I'll be staying in for the, uh, the report on this, as I believe the interest uh, allows me to do. Thank you, Archie. Um, of Henry McClellan next. Henry? Yeah, th thank you, Chair. Similar to Archie, I'm Vice Chair of that Chapel Cross Site Stakeholders Group, but I see no reason to leave the meeting. There's no conflict. Thank you, Henry. I'll just check in case there are any other declarations of interest. There are not. Okay. Thank you, members. Uh, in that case, uh, we'll move on to item three, which is the minute of the meeting of 30th January 2020. Um, clearly, this has previously been approved, so are we content to note uh, the minutes of that meeting? Thank you, members. We'll move um, swiftly on then to item four, which is the uh, Economic Recovery Plan 2019 to 2023. I beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just items 16, 17 and 18, the exempt items. Uh, obviously, borderlands is a very important thing for the Council, and I think it would perhaps be useful to bring this part of the meeting to the, to the start of the meeting rather than at the end, because by the time people potentially have to leave because of other interests or or things like that. I think it's worth having a look at it first. Uh, but we'll leave that to you. I'd, I think I'd um, perhaps gently suggest to the member that uh, a little advance notice of that might have been helpful, um, simply because clearly th there are some logistical issues, I think, so far as uh, the, the wider participation of folk on teams is concerned. I was advised before the meeting started that in order to ensure we have... Um, uh, a confidential teams meeting we would require to finish the uh, the, the current um, publicly streamed one and then recommence um, as a, a, a separate um, uh, a separate and confidential teams meeting clearly this is being live streamed at the moment um, so in order to accede to that request presumably we would require to stop that um, and then restart it once we had completed the uh, the confidential business however long that would take and clearly that would mean that anyone who is watching from the public I don't have any data on that but anyone who is watching for, uh, from the public at this point would have to go and do whatever else they wanted uh, uh, during their day and potentially be able to come back into our business at some point clearly we wouldn't be able to advise them just exactly when that would be uh, so I think perhaps uh, under the circumstances it's maybe a little more tricky to do that um, as I say if we had had some advance warning we perhaps could have done it in a different uh, in a different way and also made sure that people would have been aware of what was happening and when I think you want to come back uh, it's just to be, to be fair it was it was something I did float with uh, the director on Friday but um, there you go. I'll, I'll seek advice as to whether my my understanding of the logistical issues is, is is correct I believe that is the case and then I see councillor Nicholson wants to come in <clears throat> it's just exactly what you were saying, but I've got a diary, in, a diary insert here, and the exempt item starts at one o'clock. So, for public, if the public want to come in at one o'clock, uh, sorry, if they, 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 you know, if the members have got that, that date in their diary and the time in the diary, then that's the time the meeting starts at, and the public won't be for the first part from ten thirty. I've got two diary dates. I don't know if anybody else has either. No? You have? Yeah. Okay. Lorna? Thanks, um, thanks Councillor Johnson. The, the call for the meeting had been issued, I think, when we spoke on Friday about the potential um, for more time for the borderlands business cases, both now and in due course. So the order of the agenda is per the standing orders also on that basis and the call for the public meeting is issued on that basis. So it is something I'll um, take away in terms of future business cases coming forward and discuss that with Chair and Vice Chair and um, seek member agreement to, to doing that. But at this stage, there's also external parties joining us for the private items, including for the Dairy Nexus one from SRUC. So they're already scheduled in terms of this afternoon. I, I do appreciate the point that's been raised. I think we can reflect on it um, for future borderlands items. Um, you know, clearly, for so long as they are required to be um, held confidentially, 
we will no doubt get to a point where that's no longer necessary. But I think while we're, while we're required to look at this volume of detail, we'll have a look at that um, for the next set that we get um, to ensure that we can, we can devote adequate time to them. I do think it's a fair point. Um, however, for the time being, um, we will move on to item four. Councillor Scobie, you want to come in? Yeah, it was just the point Ronnie made. Uh, uh, is it one o'clock that we'll, we'll be taking that item then? Uh, again, happy, be a fair to, compromise, Chair. happy to be uh, uh, to be corrected on this, but my understanding was that that is a, a placeholder for members of the committee because we would require to have uh, a separate teams meeting effectively in order to um, uh, in order to conduct the, uh, the confidential part of the business. Um, I'm not clear that that requires us to start that at one o'clock. I do not believe that would be the case, but Claire, perhaps you can advise on that point? No, there's no, there's no requirement for that to start at one o'clock. It's there purely as a logistics exercise to make sure that the confidential item was, was treated correctly in teams. So that, that is distinct from a, 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 formal, um, a formal meeting notice. Councillor Wood. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. I, I actually got my document on Saturday. Now, much as uh, I wanted to, it's a very, very hefty document to get through in a very short period of time. And I want to express my concern because there are areas of detail that I'm not, or it is lacking uh, within the the document and I would like to have had the opportunity to really evaluate the content. So what I would be asking is can we defer this for a special meeting because it is an extremely important document and you're almost treating it with triviality by having it at the end and I, I don't like that uh, and I would ask the members of this committee to give it the due respect it requires, if that's at all acceptable. Okay, and I think in making a decision on that, Lorna, are there any particular um, problems uh, in terms of timescales or deadlines that a special meeting would, uh, would involve? Members were clear in the report that was taken, I think, into the July committee um, of the full council that the borderlands deal had to be achieved by Christmas this year in terms of the end of the calendar year. The progress on these business cases is essential, so any delay may impact on the, the future steps around that. So it's, it's a matter for members, but it does create difficulty potentially on those timescales. Okay, I see uh, Councillor Crothers is indicating. Ian? Thanks so much, Chair. Uh, thanks uh, for, for the points being raised. I just wonder, if if we are, we are taking the agenda items in order, as presented in the papers, should we be discussing this at that point? And there may well be a, 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 again, a point put forward at that point that actually it should be it merits the whole Council taking the decision. It's only nine days away, so that might be something that gets presented at that point. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, clearly always uh, uh, happy to hear from uh, members, and I take it as a procedural matter in the first instance. Um, however, I see that uh, the leader is indicating. Elaine? Thanks, Chair. Uh, it was just really to counsel, as the director has done, against delaying making decisions on these. Uh, there is an, uh, a need for urgency in terms of getting the, the uh, business cases up to borderlands now. Okay. It could be taken at full council, but the full council agenda is quite full as well. It wouldn't necessarily mean that there was any more time to, dis to discuss this in detail at full council than, it, than there would be here today. And I, I, I would counsel uh, or advise that we should take these items uh, now as, as we uh, intended or today as we intended and that members should be prepared to do the work, you know, in terms of reading the documentation and putting aside the time to discuss it. This is on our agendas for discussion today, and I, I believe that we should go forward with discussing it today so that we can submit these to the Borderlands Partnership Board. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Wood, do you wish to come back? Would it be possible, if a uh, full council's agenda is so he heavily uh, loaded, could we not have an extraordinary meeting? This is honestly... A, 
it's a, it's a vital piece of work that needs to be properly scrutinised. And I, I, I think that you are not giving it its due respect. That's my honest truth. Councillor McClellan, do you wish to speak? And then Councillor Driver. And then I think we must reach a decision on this and move on. Councillor McClellan. Chair, I would just like to come in. I sympathise with Councillor Wood's position, but um, like him, I, I received my documentation on Friday evening and I've spent over 16 hours scrutinising that document. I've put everything aside over the weekend to scrutinise the documents, the exempt items, in the understanding we'd be looking at that this afternoon. So I really think we've got to push ahead. We're given these documents, OK, it's a short timeline, but we've been given them, and it's some responsibility to scrutinise. And I've done that, and I think it's wrong to delay it. Thank you, Henry. Archie? Yeah, th thanks, Chair. And, and, you know, obviously, Councillor Wood is clearly understanding that this is a really piece of important work that is being done in Dumfries and Galloway, not just for the Chapel Cross side of things, but the other, the other two exempt, exempt items as well. I think from uh, my perspective, it, it's, it really should be done. There are some um, recommendations within that report that will actually put a lot of the onus on a programme board, and we need to get that one in place. But I'll... I'll uh, I think we should deal with it today, Chair. Thank you, Archie. Um, Ian, you want to speak? Uh, just to come back to the points made earlier, I think if, if we're running the agenda the way it's laid out, is let's discuss, have this discussion at item number 16, or even, uh, well, will be item number 16. I think it's worth a, definitely worth a conversation. And it's as much about actually, so Andrew's making some particular points, but the whole council isn't get a chance to have its input in this, only part of But if we could discuss that end, Chairman, I think it's important with the ongoing business. Well, we, we clearly have a variety of views in the room, um, but for the time being, I do wish to continue with the agenda as set out. Um, this is not, uh, the Borderlands uh, items are not the only important matters that we have to make decisions on today. So I do intend to move on at this point um, and we will uh, deal with the best way of deciding upon the Borderlands items when we reach them in the agenda. Okay, members, uh, with that, um, thank you for an enlivening start to the meeting. Uh, and I will move on to item four, which is the Economic Recovery Plan 2019-2023, uh, uh, report by Director of Economy and Resources. Members will recall that at full council in July, and in light of the emerging impacts of COVID-19 on our local economy, we agreed to establish seven work streams to support economic recovery in the region aimed at supporting people, businesses, and creating opportunity. We recognised that addressing economic and social recovery would be an important part of the Council's work in the coming months, and indeed years, and we're keen to ensure that we progress this work quickly. We also agreed that detailed actions would be presented to this committee for each of the work streams, and associated resource plans would be prepared and presented to us too. This report provides us with that information on how we support a sustainable, fair, and inclusive economic recovery, um, Steve Rogers is, I think, on Teams today uh, to assist if members have any questions. Steve, is there anything that you'd like to add to this before we open, uh, open this up to questions and, and member debate? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, members. Uh, no, I don't think there's anything that um, I'd like to add at this point. I'm happy to um, answer any queries or questions that any members might have on the report. Thank you, Steve. So I'll uh, open this to members' comments and questions. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, as we're all well aware, I think the next uh, next weeks, months, uh, probably the next two or three years, are going to be heavily impacted locally with our economy, and it's important that we uh, we do everything that we can to deal with that. Um, I think. As a lot of people are predicting, the potential for massive wave of job losses will probably be between October and the end of the year. Um, so it is crucial that we, we crack on with this. We've done a terrific job um, getting all these grants and things out to businesses, but the problem is by the time they burn through the cash, there's going to be a bit of a, a kind of rude awakening. Um, but the point I'm getting round to making as well, and it's a question for Steve here, is that um, we are resourcing this, which which is great. But has there been any form of impact assessment done on 
other parts of the service by increasing the expenditure in this particular way. And the next thing is I would like to give my support to the withdrawal of the money from the business loan Scotland, because I know an awful lot of other councils have taken the, taken the same approach, but uh, that's good. But if you could just enlighten me as to what the impact assessment of the extra expenditure will be on other parts of the, of the, of the organisation. Thank you. Malcolm, Steve? Chair, yes, thank you. <coughs> and um, thank you, Councillor Johnson. Um, and as um, the chair said at the beginning of the meeting, um, the uh, economic impact uh, of and, and the economic response to the um, pandemic crisis has, has really required a significant effort on the part of um, many teams uh, across the council, but in particular uh, within our own uh, service. Um, as services um, start to go back to something like um, a, a bit more normal in the future, then uh, that will undoubtedly um, in mean that there are um, competing demands effectively in, in some areas. However, I think the, certainly the view that, that we have taken so far is that one of the lessons learned from the response effort is about um, finding better ways of, of working with the resource that we currently have. And that's certainly something that, that we'll be looking to continue. So whilst we haven't um, done a, a formal impact assessment in terms of the impact on staff, there has been a formal impact assessment um, on, on the, of the impact of the plan carried out. Um, and certainly I think the impact on, on the rest of the service is very much that the priority um, for the foreseeable future will be to support the, the economic recovery um, and whether that impacts on the way in which we deal with planning applications and building warrants, for example, or the way in which we um, deal with bringing our properties back into, into use, the way that we resource the uh, work that's been undertaken uh, within the town centres. Um, there's a clear message, in, I think, in the paper that um, this is not just about um, an additional resource requirement, it's about using an, the existing resources that we have and ensuring that they are, are focused, properly focused on supporting economic recovery. Thank you, Steve. Malcolm, do you want to come back? Yeah, just to, to I mean, the, the importance of this can, cannot be overstated uh, to get our economy back back up and running. And uh, we need to obviously access as much funding for this as we can. And potentially, I was wondering, is there any lobbying being done to Scottish Government or anything on that basis to, to help Dumfries and Galloway? Certainly, I can take that one. It's an ongoing process. Um, it, uh, it, it continues uh, in, in a variety of directions. Um, one, uh, principally, which I've been involved with, members will be aware of, is uh, on the residual um, business support grants uh, and the possibility they can be made available to uh, support, uh, effectively, at Council's discretion, uh, businesses, whether they didn't actually get support um, during lockdown, uh, or whether they're facing particular difficulties and challenges in changing what they do and how they do it in order to operate in these new circumstances. Um, so these are cases that are being made um, continually uh, at, uh, uh, at the moment. I think there are also some wider issues. Uh, you quite rightly refer to um, uh, the, the risk of redundancies um, and, and the scale those might be on. Um, there is a question about the longevity of the furlough scheme. Other countries have made different decisions on that. Um, at the moment, it, it appears that it will end fairly soon uh, for the UK. Um, and I think that too has to be something that we, uh, we, we, we have a view on uh, and make representations about. Um, that, of course, is a personal opinion. The Council has, on the other hand, instructed me, for example, to lobby the Scottish Government about access to the, uh, the residual uh, business um, support grants, which is something I've, I have started doing and continue to do uh, on its behalf. I hope that's helpful. Okay, I have Councillor Scobie next. Yeah, just to echo the, the, the expressions you made there, Chair, uh, because it was in 3.4.4. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that we're still finding, or I'm finding, 
the, the self-employed hardship, m maybe not so much the self-employed hardship, I haven't heard much about that one, but on the bed and breakfast, the self-catering establishments, and they are still facing problems. Uh, they didn't qualify for the hardship fund when it was open uh, for a variety of reasons. And while I would applaud the Council's uh, small business grant and the way that they handled that in terms of the non-domestic rate scheme, uh, there was a, a definite unfairness being applied in the criteria in comparison to the bed and breakfast and self-catering uh, businesses. And again, they're hit uh, with the further uh, restrictions placed this week. Uh, where people are, are nervous about coming to the area. So again, uh, I would hope that we, you, you, you've alluded to it in terms of the residual Scottish Government grant from the 52 million, whether we've had any word back that we're able to use that as a council discretionary grant for uh, the very likes of what I've just referred to. So it would be helpful if we could get some indication there. Again, on 3.4.6, in terms of the, the restart, and I had a, post, a productive meeting with uh, Lorna yesterday, all the public realms, how we can uh, assist uh, and support businesses that want to start trading, uh, similar to, to some of the other areas to create the cafe culture in some of our towns uh, where this is possible. And I would hope that we could get ahead of the game on that one where businesses are showing that they want to continue uh, to trade come Christmas, come springtime, that they, they, they are able to either get the, the ground that they require so that they can trade outside, that we get ahead of the game and be working as we did. Uh, 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 and many people applauded uh, the, the ambassadors and the way we approached it. But I think we need that to continue. And there are other issues to look at in terms of licensing laws, public realms, and to be discussing it with the local traders. So I hope we can get ahead of the restart game. Thank you, Councillor Scobie. Um, so on the first point, I am not aware that the response has been received. It would have come to the Council rather than to my own personal address, but I'll ask for that to be checked. Um, Steve, I think, um, can you assist on the wider points regarding public realm, etc.? Thank you. Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, Certainly, uh, as um, Councillor Scobie says, the, the work that's been done in terms of working with businesses to assist them throughout the um, town centre restart process and, and, the, and the process of businesses safely uh, restarting and reopening uh, has been well received generally. And <clears throat> for that reason, uh, and reflecting the importance that our town centres have, uh, not only to the local economy, but also to our communities. Um, it does uh, feature uh, quite heavily in terms of the, the restart plan. And the intention would be to continue uh, with that work in the town centres and to apply some additional resource to that to ensure that it has um, a greater degree of resilience going forward. Um, and that, that certainly uh, will be an important part of the, the overall approach to supporting not just um, the, the kind of restart recovery, but also uh, anticipating the potential for um, future fluctuations in terms of reimposition of lockdowns um, and uh, restrictions, as, as Councillor Scobie has, has, has recognised there. Just in terms of the um, request to Scottish Government for additional funding, um, Chair, I can confirm that we have to date not, not received um, a formal response um, to that request. Uh, so we'll, we'll take that up um, again uh, on your behalf. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Grateful if that could be uh, arranged. Willie, did you want to come back? Okay, thank you very much. So, uh, moving further down the list, um, Councillor Hagman, I have you next. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Steve, for the report before us. Um, I'm just going through um, the papers, and before I start, there's 
there's once again no list of abbreviations for all the papers. Now, I, I believe um, the Education Committee have within their papers a whole list of abbreviations, and it's a request that I feel like I've been making since 2017. Can we please ensure that all the papers that come forward to us have a list of abbreviations in, in going forward? Um, my sort of second point is, and it's been raised in terms of risk assessment, I think it's crucial that we have any... Um, plans going forward that they are fully risk assessed and even if that's not published within the body of the document that we're at least given a web link to that so we can actually go through that um, the the point is you know we we've got this plan going forward but there's no mention of Brexit and I we are hurtling towards a cliff edge of potentially no deal Brexit and that will have a huge impact on our region um, there's also the issue of climate change now Councillor Campbell can't be here but um, I'm pretty certain if he had been here he would be raising this of where's the risk assessment in terms of climate change going forward with these strategies um, my questions really um they relate to, in terms of consultations that are coming from Scottish Government and our communication of our plans, what's happening with those? Um, because, again, it's a request that have been made that any consultations that are being issued by government, could they be please be highlighted to members? Now, I've not had any confirmation of any consultations happening. However, when I go online, I can see that there's various consultations happening. So that's maybe, again... Apologies, Chair. It's maybe a wider, a wider issue. Um, and again, the communications. How are we going to communicate this back, this plan back to the businesses that are going to be desperately needing the support going forward? On one specific point that I wanted to raise, if I may, um, that's in regards to our food and drink strategy. Now, it was passed back when we had EE. I committee and we had a prioritised action plan. Now, I appreciate we've had COVID and that has had an incredible impact on the services and our staff have been working um, at a fantastic pace trying to resolve issues as they as and when they come forward. However, this plan was agreed back in April 2019 and within that plan there were 28 key points that were to be achieved within the short term. Now clearly that would have taken us to April 2020, which is you know in the midst of the of the pandemic. However, it would be really useful to see where we are in terms of that work and what has been achieved. Um, having been contacted by by business owners and even in my own village here in Preetown with a whiskey broker, his staff are struggling to get into work because the buses aren't running and he's struggling to, to keep those opportunities open for his employees. Um, when I've looked at the strategy, the food and drink the food and drink is mentioned in this. However, when I have a look at the current economic staffing, I'm unsure who's taking that forward because we have got business and enterprise. And I'm just looking for clarification. Is that the council that's taking this forward? Because it, it there's three officers within that, but they're coming a huge range. That's on page 41. And certainly when I have a look on page... 45 in terms of the work streams um whereabouts does food or drink and also tourism fit within that work stream because i don't i'm not sure where the exact fit is so there's there's quite a lot there chair and forgive me that i've i've put it all in at once but if i could have some responses that'd be really useful thank you thank you councillor hagman steve can you assist certainly chair yes thank you um, just picking up on the um, on the specific points um, in relation to the to the paper, the um, the food and drink strategy, uh, as Councillor Hagman says, um, food and drink is a really important part of the um, local economy, and it is reflected in the support to businesses work stream. So. Within the um, within the action plan itself, um, and this is this is something that um, that is delivered by our own team. Um, so within the action plan itself, uh, there is reference on page 35, 34 and thirty five to the um, delivery of the food and drink strategy and uh, an outline table there of the key. Um, elements of that that we propose to um, 
prioritise uh, as part of the um, as part of the recovery plan. And um, so, uh, hopefully, that um, that addresses the the queries re raised by Councillor Hagman. Chair, if I may, just on that one point, um, on the on page 34, 35, yes, I appreciate it's on there, but at the top of that table, it says that it's led by slash working with food sector groups. So it doesn't appear that it's being led by the local authority, but if that's not correct, I'm happy to be corrected on that. Steve, if you can advise on that, please. Yeah, yeah, certainly in the short term, our role is to is to coordinate that 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 work. Uh, so we will be uh, and, and have been providing uh, leadership on that as we go forward, um, and as the um, South of Scotland Enterprise Agency become better established, there's a dialogue to be had with them in terms of who's going to pick up that that lead role. But certainly in the short term, uh, that will be us. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, I have Councillor McClellan next. Thank you, Chair. The, Steve, just um, this would be a question back to Steve. Picking up on the comment he made regarding planning and building control, I think it's well recognised by both our Scottish Government and Westminster the part that the construction sector will play in the economic recovery. And Steve made a comment earlier regarding planning and building control. Um, are we positioned to support a very quick uh, recovery and turnaround in terms of any applications coming in through RSLs and the private sector? There's certainly a lot of construction activity and ground been trying to be made up in the last few months. But um, the if we if we're not in a position to move on significant applications will do nothing but stall the recovery. Have you any views on that, Steve? Thank you, Henry. Steve? Yep, Chair, um, thank you. Um, certainly, um, the service has had to operate in a, in a different fashion um, as a result of the, of the um, lockdown and the restrictions. Um, but as certainly as we move um, towards uh, the, the, and through the restart uh, of services, then the capacity levels are, are, are building up. Um, we're in the process of uh, implementing the, the new structure in building standards uh, as a result of the external review that was carried out last year. Um, and we're, we're picking up that recruitment process again. Uh, and certainly the, the, the planning service has been able to maintain its capacity uh, even with remote working. And I think that's reflected in uh, some of the more recent cases that we've dealt with where we have prioritised um, <clears throat> the resource onto um, putting those applications through quickly because of the importance that they bring to the local economy. I'm, I'm thinking in particular of, a, of an application by Alpha Solway. Um, which was um, processed extremely quickly, recognising the importance uh, of that uh, business to the economic recovery. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Steve. I think that's helpful. Um, Henry, do you wish to come back? Happy with that? Yeah, just yeah, just very quickly, Chair. And uh, I was fully aware of the Alpha Solway, and I just think that's an example of what we can actually do. And uh, again, that's significant employment opportunities. But again, uh, we'll be faced with a number of these, and I appreciate uh, Steve's comment there and commitment. Yep, I think uh, I think it's a very good point. Thank you. I have Councillor Marshall next. Sean. Thank you, Chair. Um, got a couple of points to make, uh, but first of all, kind of. Can I say I welcome this report? I think um, totally support the additional requirement for resources within the Economic Development uh, Department. A couple of points though, in, in Appendix 1 on recovery plan, um, I think it's got to be vital going forward that, you know, recovering from COVID-19, we need to have successful town centre regeneration across our towns. Um, and just mention on page 29, that we need to work with partners uh, and organisations. 
And on, on page 29, it mentioned Anna Regeneration Steering Group. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of good work. But it's really just a reminder that, and I have raised this on a number of occasions over the last two years, um, there's an action that the council need to identify the appropriate special purpose vehicle that could be replicated. At the moment, Anna Regeneration Steering Group isn't a constituted body. You know, if it was a trust or something like that, it'd be able to draw down funding. And if it's successful, you know, we can we can replicate that across the region. So I just really want to know where we are with that, because more so than ever, we're going to have to rely on, on working with communities and, and groups like Anna Regeneration Steering Group. And um, my other two points is on Appendix 2. Um, the, the current staffing doesn't actually identify um, how many consultants that we're employing at the moment. And if we are successful in getting additional resources, uh, will that exclude the need for, for consultants uh, going forward? Uh, and the other point on Appendix 2, there seems to be no um, mention or no note of the fact that um, the CX Project 2, which obviously is the development of the Chapel Cross site going forward as part of the Borderlands, we managed, the council managed to secure half a million pounds from the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. Um, and that was to be match funded from Scottish Enterprise and the council and resources. And I'm just wondering where that is within the report, because that's a substantial uh, amount of funding over the next few years. Thanks, Jay. Thank you, Sean. Um, Steve, can you take those points, please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just first of all, uh, dealing with the uh, issues raised in respect of the, the town centres and the Annan Regeneration Steering Group, <clears throat> I think one of the intentions um, in terms of the priority given to, um, if you like, place more of a place-focused approach is to learn some of those lessons from the um, Annan um, approach and 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 the um, and the, the the kind of cross-cutting team approach that's being adopted. So um, certainly, as we go forward with expanding the work into other areas and building really on the work that's been done by the town centre task teams, part of that will involve looking at um, possible future models of delivery and future models of of. Um, strategic uh, coordination locally. <clears throat> we also do need to engage with, with some of our key partners uh, in that dialogue. Uh, in particular, um, South of Scotland Enterprise um, have also indicated that, that they uh, wish to adopt a place-based approach. So I think it will be important for us um, to ensure that, that we, we approach this in a, in a partnership fashion with them so that we can both maximise the resource that we have to, to, to bring to this. In terms of um, Appendix 2 and the staffing, um, so the staff listing there is, is intended to be um, <clears throat> a reference point in terms of providing members with that uh, baseline information in terms of what staff we currently have in post um, and available to assist with the delivery of the action plan. That is supplemented, as Councillor Marshall says, um, when necessary by the use of external consultants. And, and the external the use of external consultants tends to be um, in areas where there is particular specialism and expertise required and also um, where we require uh, relatively short, sharp inputs uh, at particular um, stages of development. So at the present time, um, and as, as we'll see later on this afternoon uh, with, the, with the agenda items on the Borderlands business cases, um, we do rely extensively on consultants and, and their expertise and knowledge to, to develop and prepare the bulk of that, of, of that work, and, and that would need to continue. So the, um, the intention here is, is that we're building a bit more resilience for the future so that when we come through 
that period of building um, business cases and, and having to commission detailed design work that we that we will behind that be building some internal capacity to take the projects forward and hopefully that um that answers the question uh, and the NDA funding, I can certainly provide um, members with a with a further um, breakdown of of the funding that we've been successfully uh, able to access through NDA to support the work um, within Chapel Cross, and, and no doubt that's again something that might get picked up uh, later on this afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Sean, is that helpful? Yeah, that's helpful. Just. Just to come back quickly on, on, on two points, I think there is an already, you know, a, a long-standing action for the council, you know, over two years now to, to identify a special uh, purpose vehicle. And, and maybe because of COVID-19, it needs to be slightly different, but I think that's vital going forward. So it should be a priority piece of work because, uh, um, you know, no matter how many resources we pour into this, we are going to rely on, on, on communities. And if we can actually have... Um, organisations that are set up that can actually help the council deliver that, and um, that that's vital going forward. Um, and on the second point, with regards to the consultancies, I, I totally appreciate that we need expertise, but um, the longer term uh, objective should be, especially with Borderlands. Um, if you look at the Chapel Cross site in particular, that's going to be something that's going to be with us for decades. So really, we should be looking uh, as part of the forward plan of instead of totally relying on consultants or on an ongoing basis, we really need to kind of start recruiting experts in to deliver these um, transformational projects. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I have Councillor Hislop next, Ivor. Thank you, Chair. I think it's just to sort of reiterate some of the comments Councillor Johnston made. You know, we're looking at this from today's position I think we're not at the bottom of the dip yet. I think there's more to come. It's going to be harder um, and how we're going to get back out of it. Uh, one of the big concerns is the fact that you know we're looking to train young people, uh, older people who may need redeployed. Well, yes, you can train people, but if there's no jobs there to actually train them for, uh, you know, the recent case I heard was one of the local hotels applied for a very honourable job, dishwasher, I do it myself, and uh, they had 100 applicants from all age groups, all ranges of businesses, um, self-employed people, you name it, for a dishwasher. Now, this is the fear, I think, that's out there with the public just now they are all looking for a job because they don't know what's going to happen after the 31st of October, I think it's the current date for the furlough scheme to end. Um, we also have the problem of a decision that was rightly taken, I think, uh, by the First Minister and her team to bring in the six members in a group or two families, but that actually has an impact now it might just have been the good day yesterday, but it was like 25% our takings dropped yesterday with the introduction of these new schemes. Because usually you get three ladies coming out for their lunch. Well, that's two tables now that you have to take up rather than one previously. So these are going to cause an issue going forward. And I think we've still to find what the problems are going to be. So we're sort of guessing just now, I think, uh, of where we need to start. Um, the other one that I was going to ask that was kind of causing me a wee bit of concern, I agree with the drawing down of the funding from the business loan, but can you just tell me what the toolkit is? Because the way it reads, we're just going to spend this money on developing a toolkit. I hope it's not just 200 odd thousand to develop the toolkit, but there's a loan fund in there or there's funding in there that we can use. It's maybe just the way it's written in the report, but you know it says uh, the money is there to establish a funding toolkit. I would like to think that it's actually there to be part of the funding toolkit. Thanks, Ivor. I'll bring Stephen on on the latter point. I fear you may be right. 
um, so far as the, the wider picture is concerned. It is impossible for us to tell yet, but it is at least possible uh, that what you are suggesting is where we will end up. Uh, I think it's quite likely that we will continue to have to revise this action plan um, and, and change what we are doing to respond to the, um, the, the, the behaviour of the virus and the behaviour of people um, uh, in, in very strange circumstances, very unusual circumstances indeed. Um, and you do, I think, rightly reflect that you know, some of these things are not directly within our control and the furlough scheme is undoubtedly a very big one. Um, we can say things about it, but of course we can't do anything about it. Um, but I'll bring Stephen on the, uh, the, the point regarding the, the funding toolkit, which I think is a, uh, I think that's a, an issue of expression rather than what we plan yeah. to do. But if you can clarify that, that would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Chair. Thank you. I'm happy to do so. So yes, the intention uh, would be that um, that funding um, would be directed towards um, small businesses, possibly through um, a micro grant or micro loan scheme to support um, some of the ongoing work that's set out um, on pages 32 and 33 around support to businesses, because I think um, certainly Councillor Hislop makes an important point, that, which is that um, there has to be a focus on uh, where is the future growth going to come from in terms of um, employment, uh, and for that reason, um, there is uh, a, a significant number of uh, actions and uh, interventions proposed um, in terms of support to businesses. Some of those are uh, very much around um, learning some lessons from the impact um, of the lockdown on businesses, especially around the need for them to become a lot more uh, digital in their activities and, and to um, really grasp the opportunities that are presented by digital uh, trading, online trading. And um, so we're just about um, with uh, support that's, that's come to us through uh, Business Gateway. And um, we're just about to, um, to launch uh, a whole program of events and activities to provide um, help, support, advice and guidance um, in a hands-on way uh, to businesses to help them. Uh, with uh, those um, digitization challenges and, and, and to, to try to try to help them to become uh, certainly uh, a lot more resilient to, to future um, shocks of this nature uh, where they have that uh, digital platform to be able to fall back on to, um, to help them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Ivor, do you want to come back? Content with that? The only thing is... I don't worry so much about the young people because I think they are able to cope with more digital stuff. Um, so maybe I should have declared interest. The, fifth, the over 50s uh, might be more challenged at getting jobs and their retraining might be a better idea um, because young people are adaptable, young people can change. Um, there might not be the jobs there, but I think they're the ones who can change quicker. Uh, either, I think they're wired that way now, whereas we were sort of set, this is how you did something, and I think we find it more difficult to change. You can't possibly be over 50 yet, surely not. Okay, I take the point, thank you. Um, so, uh, Leader, you're next, Elaine. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, can I say I, I welcome the focus on community wealth building. I think that's going to be very important and the way in which we help our region to recover from, from COVID. So I'm very pleased to see that there. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the process for the additional core staff uh, recruitment. Um, I know that the trade unions in the past have raised concerns about people in redeployment not always being aware of new positions within the council. So uh, just to, to seek your reassurance that they, these positions will be uh, highlighted to people who are in the redeployment pool. I mean, certainly know that uh, in some of the budget cuts in the past, there have been people from e economic development who have ended up in redeployment and maybe in a position uh, to come back in. Uh, and secondly, to ask uh, what sort of training, obviously these are slightly new areas of work, and what sort of training might be available to people to help them to get up to speed. Thanks, Elaine. Steve, can you assist with those points, please? Chair, uh, yes, certainly. Um, the recruitment process um, internally requires us um, to initially um, offer opportunities through um, the um, 
redeployment uh, process through the redeployment pool so that we, we would that, that that process would automatically be followed so um, there will be opportunities there for any folk with um, suitable skills or who could with a degree of um, assistance and support um, be suitable for, for, for any new posts um, and so that that will certainly happen um, <clears throat> It, and with regard to uh, ongoing uh, training, then um, certainly there is uh, a, a whole suite of um, training that's available internally to to staff, and and we would certainly make sure that that uh, was made available to um, new recruits. But I think also in addition to that, um, there's uh, a lot of mentoring support. Uh, that we make available and, and would make available to individuals um, to support them, particularly as part of that initial um, process of, of, of integration and, and getting to grips with, with new ways of, of working, which we've, we've all had to do uh, over the past few months. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Um Elaine, if, if that's helpful, or is there anything else you want to ask or come back? That, yeah, that, that's helpful, I'm saying. It, it, it's a concern that's been raised by the trade unions, and I'm sure that they will be uh, reassured to hear that from Steve. Thanks. Thanks, Elaine. Councillor Wood, have you next, Andrew? Uh, thank you, Chair. It's really seeking clarification in the recommendations where, in 2.1, we're <coughs> agreeing the details of the economic recovery. That's fine. And then in 2.3, we're asked to agree the additional resources, and once again, that's set out quite clearly in Appendix 3. No issue with that. 2.5, we're asked to agree <coughs> to request allocation of funding. Now, further on down, it says that uh, for the next two years to support economic recovery are considered as part of the process. Surely that should be taken out, the considered, and it should be part of the process. Otherwise, we could end up spending a quarter of a million and fail to meet our objective. And another point I'd like to ask, and that is, throughout all of the committees, there are ex additional expenditure taking place. Is it possible that the Council can put together a tracker spreadsheet so that we are able to see on a weekly basis exactly where the Council is with regards to the additional expenditure that we are all agreeing to from day to day? Thank you, Councillor Wood. Uh, I think in fairness we have to respect the budget process. Um, the budget makes decisions that, that, that clearly um, are, are, are outrank everything else in, in terms of our decision making. Um, so we can't prejudge that, but certainly what we should do is set out what that resource requirement would be in a full year if we are to carry this forward. Certainly in my view we should do, um, so you know, we'll clearly have to find that uh, uh, resource. Other groups that want to make um, uh, uh, budget proposals will decide to do that or to do something more or something less, uh, which is entirely their gift. But the purpose of this is to set out the resource requirement that would be, that would be needed in, in a full financial year um, in order to resource this plan that we're taking up today. Obviously, we're in a situation where we continue to have one-year budgets. I, I suspect that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, and for once, I'll, uh, I'll offer a degree of sympathy to the, uh, uh, to the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, I don't think he's got a particularly easy job uh, at the moment, um, to, to be perfectly frank. But I think it's quite likely that we'll be working uh, on, on one-year budget to one-year budget for some time to come. That being, therefore, the reason for that being uh, uh, set out in the recommendation as it, uh, as it is. Uh, on on the, bright, the wider point on um, uh, tracking uh, expenditure, Lorna, perhaps that's one that you could assist with, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wood. Um, the additional expenditure for COVID has been reported consistently at full council, and I would imagine and expect that the Finance Procurement Transformation Committee will now start to receive the, the uh, council-wide revenue outturn reports in terms of monitoring. Um, within the service committee cycle, and indeed in this agenda, the report includes information on the spend in terms of the core budget for economy and resources, but also indicates that portion of the overall spend so far and projected on COVID that relates to services within economy and resources too. So there is information coming forward to members on the normal cycle, Councillor Wood. Um, I, I would suggest if there's further requests around uh, monitoring and information and development of that information, it may be best 
addressed through the Finance Procurement Transformation Committee early October. Okay, thank you, Lorna. Uh, Andrew, you want to come back? If, if you don't mind, Chair, thank you. But still coming back to the word considered, I, I, I need to get clarification as to whether if that is an appropriate word to have in there or sh whether if we should in actual fact be agreeing that it has to be part of the process. Because as, as, as I did state earlier, we could end up committing ourselves to a quarter of a million that's not going to meet the end objective of uh, what we're trying to do here. So happy to look at that when we get to, um, to the recommendations, but clearly uh, there's nothing that we can say as a committee that can, uh, that can bind a, a budget setting process to follow in exactly the same decision if the people drawing up that uh, budget proposal want to do something different. Now, I certainly don't think the administration will, but other people may do so. Um, and and if, if their proposal prevails, then that supersedes any, any previous decision, which is, after all, how budgets work. Um, but we can certainly look at making the, uh, the recommendation more robust, because you know, I wouldn't want to, uh, uh, to, to put up a quarter of a million pounds and then stop funding this uh, at uh, the beginning of the next financial year. I think that would be bizarre. OK, I'll have Councillor Hagman next. Thank you, Chair, for letting me come back in again. I've been listening to see if some of my previous questions were answered, and unfortunately they haven't. So I guess my, my previous questions still stand insofar as is there going to be a communication plan going out with this? And in terms of any consultations that are coming in to the Council, can members please be cited on that? Um, I do have an additional question, if I may, and that's in regards to um, trading standards. Now, I see in page 43, the work stream for recruiting staff safe trading and restart comes under communities. Um, however, we do have it in here on page 29 under safe trading and restart. So I'm just looking for clarification as to where does trading standards sit within that. And again, I'm I'm going to mention again, we're hurtling towards a no-deal Brexit. We're hurtling towards potentially a hard border at Cairn Ryan. Um, should we not, in fact, also have the borders, border agency within that? Because clearly that may have implications. And OK, that's not for today, but within six months we could be looking at that. So are we at least having those discussions with the border agencies of how we ensure safe trading throughout our ports in the in the region? As, as chair of the Harbours Committee, it's certainly one that I'm, I'm very aware of. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Communications plan, yes. Um, certainly, I think the administration intends to be saying a great deal about this. Um, as you can understand, it has to be a core part of our activity. Uh, as, as a council um, going forward, uh, one of the biggest issues that we will have to deal with. Uh, on the other points um, that Katie raised, Steve, are you able to assist with those, please? Um, yes, Chair, um, thank you. Um, and as you say, the communications plan has been really a, a key component of the initial response and, and uh, recover, restart phase, and uh, it will continue to be an important component of the of the recovery plan, and it, it is going to be absolutely critical in terms of our communication uh, with local businesses and local communities to let them know what's happening and what's available, what what assistance and help is there to support them. Um, with regard to the input that we've had um, to date from both trading standards and environmental health uh, and other services from from other departments. Uh, in terms of the the, the town centre restart and the, and the, and in, and also the safe trading um, aspect of that. Um, that that's absolutely critical that that is able to continue and I understand that the um, the resource requirements of that would be um, considered uh, separately uh, from this committee because those two services don't fall within within our um, within our remit um, with regard to Brexit uh, and dialogue with the with the border agencies, I can confirm certainly that the, the, the um, internal Brexit working group um, has recently been stood up again, uh, and I think at I believe that certainly at full council um, the issue of Brexit um, was agreed as being one of those um, key um, strategic risks 
for the council uh, and therefore is 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 currently being addressed uh, through that uh, through that working group and that will include um dialogue with with all uh, external partners that, that have got a role to play uh, in terms of helping us uh, through uh, that um, that Brexit process. Um, and there is still, um, as Councillor Hagman says, there is still some uncertainty uh, around what what that might uh, what that might look like. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. And I have Councillor Ingalls next, David. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Steve, for this report. A uh, quick question on page 26366 uh, regarding the Kickstart and Youth Guarantee Initiatives. It uh, will provide support to young people through the provision of work placements, promotion of apprenticeship opportunities and encouraging public, private and third sectors to employ young people. I'd be interested to know the detail uh, in each of these three specific items, if you can, if you can give me a bit of brief detail on how that's going to be delivered. Thank you, David. Steve, can you assist with that, please? <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Um, certainly, the the detail of that um, is still being worked on at the moment, um, and it's primarily going to be coordinated through the local employability partnership. Um, working with our partners uh, and the local employability partnership has just agreed to set up a, a short life working group um, to, to, to work these details out. Um, certainly as and when that detail becomes available it will be our intention to bring a report back to this committee setting that out for you. Thank you Steve. Thank you, David. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I now have uh, Councillor Thompson. Stephen. Uh, thanks, Chair. Yeah, so I mean, my question seems quite minor in comparison to what's been discussed already, but uh, at 3.4.6, uh, it talks about um, the communication with uh, sort of town centre restart groups for businesses and communities. Um, and I was just sort of wondering, uh, I think there's maybe a mixed picture of this across the region. Uh, I know certainly in Annandale North Ward we get weekly updates from our town centre restart teams about um, what activities are taking place um, and what engagement's been happening or what the issues maybe are in those particular towns and settlements within the, the, the ward area. Um, presumably, well, could I get an assurance from the relevant officer that this is actually happening consistently across the region because, uh, you know, if you read some newspapers you would think it hadn't. So it was just really to get that assurance. Um, yeah, and, and just to further uh, Councillor Hagman's point about um, the impending sort of Brexit situation, I think we do have a, a, a problem with compliance, which I think we've touched upon in our procurement workshops, but also I think with trade and standards, with planning. While we want to support um, as quickly as possible all the businesses and uh, developments that can take place to support a, a resilient future, I think we have to be very mindful of uh, taking the appropriate care to do it properly. Uh, and ensure that there's some kind of protection in place so that people don't just run amok in a lawless <laughs> opportunism. So um, not that that's what Brexit's all about, surely. But, um, but I think there is something about investing properly in trading standards and compliance because people do worry that things aren't getting done right and people are getting away with things. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I, uh, yes, I, I rather wonder about your post-apocalyptic uh, uh, description, but I think at the moment we have to allow that anything is possible. Um, Steve, can I bring you in on the point about um, communication in terms of town centre uh, action teams, please? Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, certainly the intention is that members receive a weekly briefing update from the local task team lead officer. And I will remind uh, all of the um, lead officers of, of, of that necessity because um, it's, it's essential that, that members are kept advised about um, what's happening uh, within each of the task teams at, at, at local level. So yes, Chair, I can assure you that um, that's the intention. If it isn't happening, then uh, I will reinforce that with the, with the task team lead officers. Thank you, Steve. I think that, that would be much appreciated. Um, that's, that's good. So I don't see any further members indicating they wish to speak, in which case 
we've had a good debate on this really important item. Ah, Councillor Scobie, you've waited till the Not end. Not Chair, I, I, I was just Carry anticipating your moving to the recommendations. I, it's Final really answer. just on, on the point being made, and I made it earlier and Stephen uh, came in at the end there and, and notwithstanding what Steve says, if there's any way we could make it more robust, you know, I see in 2.3, for instance, agree the additional resources uh, and then in 2.6, agree the early actions. I think it's important that we, we build in there that we do look for early action on the development of the town centres, the public realms, uh, and that we build that into that because it's not only this committee, it's other, it's communities' committees as well that are responsible uh, for some of the other issues. Uh, and I would like to see it built in there so that it's not just Steve relying on, on his team, but we build it in there that we're looking for actions in the town centres uh, for traders to be trading where it's appropriate uh, in outside places, uh, just to build it into the recommendations and that we agree it. I, I, I appreciate the sentiment. I think actually there is broad agreement on that. In fact, have your former words in mind in particular? Just at 2.3, Chair, if, it, if it's appropriate, and I note 2.6, but it doesn't refer to that in paragraphs 5.3, uh, rather than to agree the additional resources and early action is taken regarding support and assistance for outside trading, and then go on to require to deliver the agreed economic recovery streams. That could be accepted. And that seems to me to be reasonable and to reflect what we're, what, what officers have advised us we're looking at already. So I don't think there's any yeah. particular problem with that being included, not so far as I can see. Um, so we'll go through the recommendations one by one. Um, I think in order just to, to, to have clarity on where we are with them, given there are eight of them. Um, so, at 2.1, uh, are we content to agree the detailed actions for each economic recovery work stream as set out in Appendix 1? Keeping an eye on the chat as well. Okay. At 2.2, then, are we um, content to note um, the current resources available for economic de uh, development activity and the deployment of these resources to work streams as ac and actions as set out in Appendix 2? Again, take it where we are. At 2.3, uh, agree the additional resources required to deliver the agreed economic recovery work streams uh, detailed in the resource plan at Appendix 3, summarised as uh, 262,700 in this financial year, up to 682,000 in each of the future two financial years. Content to agree that? Again, it appears we are. Okay. And at 2.4, uh, note the additional resource requirements uh, that have been indicated in financial budget protections, projections for 2021, 21, 22, 22, 23, reported to full council on 27th August. Content to note? Okay. And I see David comment in the chat. Yes, that's uh, I think exactly what I'm going to come to. Uh, 2.5. Are we content to agree to request allocation of funding of 262,700 um, for this financial year from the Finance, Procurement and Transformation Committee um, for the resources to support economic recovery in this financial year and to indicate that further resources for the next two years to support economic recovery are considered as part of the process of setting the Council's budget uh, early in 2021? I see Councillor Wood has left. I take it we are content... Councillor Hislop. Chair, do we really need to ask for that? Because there's a £680,000 uh, underspend in the current year because we haven't done it. So do we need to actually ask for extra money because we've actually got money in the bank just now? I'll ask the director to assist us on that one, please. Thanks. Councillor Hislop, you'll be aware that the COVID costs um, that have been monitored by members have also taken account of any <clears throat> opportunistic savings on spend um, to offset those costs. So they've already been included. The financial report covers that later on. So in terms of the uh, budget for this year, definitely we, we do need those additional resources if we won't be able to make moves on the uh, action plan and the early action that's been described. Um, and, and just to cover the, the second part, I think it's 
obviously um, understanding that members have a decision to make on their budget in due course, but it was to put a, um, a marker and a reminder then that this is an area of consideration without any expectation and presuming members will decide in their budget. So that was why it was described in that way in the, in the report. Okay, Ivor, are you happy with that? Um, it, it turns out not to be the windfall that we'd hoped for. It's effectively spoken for, I think, it would be fair to say. So on that basis, with that additional information, are we content to agree 2.5? Okay. Uh, and then at 2.6, um, taking into account um, what Councillor Scobie said and Councillor Engel's suggestion uh, about adding retail sector at, two point, uh, at the end of that recommendation, could we agree that early action is taken to ensure that support is made available to key economic sector bodies, including tourism and food and drink, as outlined in paragraph 3.6.3, it should be, not 3.5.3. My apologies, members. Um, and uh, that uh, action is also taken to support uh, outdoor trading in town centres. Yep. Would members be content with that? As I say, I think that reflects the intentions that, yep. that, were, that have been reported to us. Nothing wrong with making it explicit on the face of the, uh, the, the decision. OK, at 2.7. Um, can we agree officers be authorised to seek early drawdown of funding available through the Business Loan Scotland Fund and that this be used to establish a funding toolkit from which support would be provided on a discretionary basis as outlined in paragraph 3.6.9? Thank you. And at 2.8, I agree to receive further updates and review of the work streams every six months uh, and reflecting development of the regional economic strategy, the borderland regional growth deal and pro progress in establishing the North Channel Partnership. Are we content to agree that? Ah, uh, Councillor Marshall, just before I close the item. Sean, carry on. Yes, that's true. I'm, I'm just looking at the most appropriate um, bullet point uh, of recommendations where we get an update, but that I take that will be a financial update as well. And I just want to, to make sure going forward that we not only get the picture of what it costs the council through their own staff, but also um, the, the amount that we're paying out on consultancies as we go forward as part of this plan. Okay, I think we can ensure that detail is provided, Sean. I don't think that would be a problem. Um, not at all. Okay, with that, are we content to agree 2.8? I think also on the understanding that we may have to look at things uh, slightly more often than that, depending on uh, what, what happens uh, in quite an unpredictable situation. Thank you, members. With that, uh, that concludes that item. Um, appreciate your time and feedback. And we will move on to uh, item five, which is the South of Scotland Indicative Regional Spatial Strategy, report by Head of Economy and Development. Um, this report presents us with an indicative regional spatial strategy for the south of Scotland and the strategy has been prepared jointly with Scottish Borders Council. Um, the strategy has been prepared following the recent provisions of the Planning Scotland Act 2019 um, and the opportunity to inform the Scottish Government's review of the national planning framework. The identification of strategic developments across the south of Scotland within the interim spatial strategy is important uh, to allow us to ensure that we can influence uh, that wider review um, of, of uh, MPF4. So David Sutty and Shona McCoy are present on Teams to respond to any questions members may have on the report. David, Shona, is there anything that you'd like to add before we go to questions and comments? Uh, morning, Chair. No, there's nothing to add to the report. Okay, that's grand. Thank you both. Um, I'll open this to members' questions and comments. Uh, Councillor Johnson, welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just looking at the, 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 the timetable we've got here, recommendation 2.3, authorise the Head of Economy and Development to make minor changes. Well, I always like to know what the definition of minor is. <laughs> you could have predicted that question, probably. And, uh, and I, I'm, I'm a great believer in members getting oversight of things before they're sent, but in this particular instance, it's due in on the 18th of September. So what happens if we, we don't agree it? We've got three days in which, which, which to come up with an alternative plan. You know, the timing seems very tight uh, from that point of view. And the next thing, looking at the actual plan as well, we seem we're heavily dependent on... Uh, E75. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm happy with that being done. But our 
our strategy seems very heavy, heavily dependent on that with uh, our free port and our uh, business units along the road. And, and again, we're referring to 2050 as, uh, I'm going to you know, be surprised at what I'm about to say. We've got the climate change risk assessment thing. Has that been taken into account? Just, just questions I'm putting out there. Timetable, and we're dependent on the road infrastructure predominantly. Thank you, uh, thank you, Malcolm. I, I certainly did anticipate one of those. And yes, the time the, the timescales for this I think are even tighter than the Brexit negotiations. But um, uh, David, Shona, can you uh, assist on? Uh, certainly on the process points uh, in the first instance, please. Uh, I'll try and, and answer. Thank you very much, Chair, for that. Um, in terms of the, the minor changes that were asked about there, it would only be tidying up spelling mistakes, presentation through bullet points, that type of thing. It wouldn't be a redraft of the of the document that's in front of members today. Um, the the timing is tight. Um, the whole process for preparing this document has been tight, and it's been set by Scottish government. Um, unfortunately, COVID and the pandemic has had a real impact on the ability to prepare the indicative regional spatial strategy. And I would like to reinforce that it is only indicative. Um, and as we have set out in the report, what the spatial strategy in front of members seeks to do is pull together a lot of projects and, and, and programmes, either through borderlands or other initiatives that members are already aware of. Um, it is heavily dependent on the A75 um, and other road networks and Scottish borders. But I think that's reflective of the issues and perhaps the opportunities we have in the south of Scotland. Um, and again, reflects various strands of work that are being progressed through the Borderlands um, growth deal. It does say in the start of it as well that it set, sets the framework to 2050. That again is set by the Scottish Government, which is what National Planning Framework 4 sets it to. Um, it's looking ahead for the next 30 years. But within that, there is a, a 10 year review programme. Um, and climate change, the final point there made by Councillor Johnson is uh, yeah, climate change is a key consideration within the whole document. Um, if you like, it sort of pulls together a lot of the various themes that are in the document as to how we can hopefully address and recognises the fact that our council have declared a climate emergency and are looking to set out um, actions for achievement in 2025. Okay, thanks, Shona. Um, Malcolm, you want to come back? Yeah, it's just a, 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 a simple point. Um, we mentioned connectivity, and it's largely expressed in terms of uh, road haulage and things in here, but uh, I don't... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see any mention of uh, digital infrastructure and connectivity within this, whether it be wireless networks or whatever. Okay. Um, David, Shona, can either of you assist with that, please? Yeah, I think we we do mention um, digital connectivity um, in in the connectivity part of the of the document. Again, recognising that digital connectivity is a really important um, part and, and an area that we need development to take place in. I'm just actually trying to find the actual project well, number. I don't know if, if David can help has... chair. So it's. Yeah, it's um, Strategic Development uh, 21, which is on the 21st page of the document. Sorry, I don't have your agenda number of pages. It's page 71. Page 71, yes, I see that there. Does that help, Malcolm? Yeah. Uh, it's actually, it's not mentioned on the uh, diagram at the back, but um, no, no, that's absolutely fine. I think... Uh, like Ivor, time's not being kind to me, and small writing and reports doesn't doesn't help. <laughs> I'm starting to find that now. I wonder what on earth I've got to look forward to. Okay, Councillor Hagman next, uh, then followed by Councillor McComb. Katie. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report before us. Um, 
I've got a couple of questions, really. And the first one um, is in regards to the the flood schemes that are mentioned in here. And we have mentioned Newton Stewart, but um, Strindar flood scheme isn't isn't mentioned in this going forward. Um, the second point I have is there's quite a lot of references to Strindar Gateway Project, and I'm just not 100% sure what that is. We've got later on under our capital projects, the Strindar and Shaping the West, um, and certainly that takes in the wider area, including the mackers. So I'm just wondering if I can get an explanation on that terminology, because if Strindar and Shaping the West is now migrated into Strindar Gateway Project, it would be really useful to have a clear understanding of what that is. Um, and I'm actually going to touch on a subject I've, I've brought up at the last um, the last item, and that, again, is our food and drink industry. Our food and drink industry is worth £1.2 billion, according to our own document. And certainly looking at this going forward, it's not even, food and drink isn't even within the main issues or opportunities. We do have a slight reference that low wage economy is dependent on traditional rural sectors such as ag agriculture. So if that's our only nod to that really important sector, um, I am slightly concerned as to how that that goes forward. And the fact that the Borderlands project that we're going to be looking at later in the exempt item, the Dairy Nexus business case, that's referenced in here. So that, that clearly... Um, is an indication of how important our dairy industry is, but yet it's not it's not given any gravitas as such within either what our main issues are or what our main opportunities are for the next thirty years. And clearly, if we're looking at a plan that we're we're wanting to take forward for the next thirty years, we want it to be as robust as possible. So, I, if I could get a response on those three points, that'd be really useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Katie. Um, Shona, David, can you respond to those points, please? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll um, I'll make a start on those, and David can jump in if I if I miss anything. Um, in terms of the the flood schemes, we did consult with our um, flood management team, and they didn't highlight um, Stranraer to us, but we will certainly take that away and speak to them again about it. I think the reference to flood schemes that we have. Um, as a project is actually, as you say, Councillor Hagman, um, we've mentioned um, Dumfries, Langham and Newton Stewart in terms of actual protection schemes, but I will get clarification on that. Um, in terms of the Stranraer Gateway project, that's pulling together, really basing on, on the Borderlands project around about Stranraer Waterfront. Um, it doesn't go as wide as the the project that Councillor Hagman spoke about that, that goes um, further down the area, as it says on page 67, um, which gives a bit more detail on the project, um, it's looking um, to recognise a lot of work that is happening in Stranraer, um, including, as I say, the, the waterfront project, work happening around about improved transport infrastructure, um, discussions that are happening around about the train station relocation, um, there's been discussions around about Freeport, um, linking in with green energy, the potential for the use of the network there for hydrogen. There is a bit of a marker, the number of, of schemes that, that are happening in Strunrar. Um, and in terms of food and drink, yeah, again, I would um, we recognise, obviously, the importance of that sector. What we've tried to do in, in this document um, is... Under the economy section on page 61, um, and under under the approach, um, sort of through the delivery of strategic developments, is that we're sort of good recognising the need to explore the potential of, of key sectors. Um, so we recognise that, given this is only indicative, that it probably doesn't go into all the detail that it perhaps could. But I think there needs to be a recognition that that this indicative strategy. We'll look to work with a number of other strategies that, that are taking place and those were outlined in, in the previous report that the members have just considered. Um, I don't know if David wants to add anything else to that. Thanks, Shona. David? Sure. Uh, 
There, there's probably not an awful lot to add to that, other than obviously what we're looking at here at the, the appendix at the back is actual strategic uh, projects, so that they're the the critical ones that we're, we're looking at. There will be other issues, which obviously we can't capture everything in this document. Um, number 11, though, is the Dairy Innovation Centre, so that clearly does look at um, the that side of things. Thanks, David. Um, Katie, do you want to come back? Thank you, Chair. No, I'll leave it just now. Thank you. OK, thank you, Katie. Um, Councillor McComb, I'll have you next. Jim. Thanks, Chair. I'm looking at page 76, the map of strategic projects. It does not make it clear that number 31 the rail improvement to Stranraer and Cairn Ryan actually goes to Cairn Ryan. Is it assumed that it will connect with the port of Cairn Ryan? Thank you, Jim. Um, Shona, can we clarify that, please? Um, yeah, thank you very much for that, Chair. Um, I think the issue we've got with the, the diagram on page 76 is that we're trying to map all the possible projects that we can for the whole of the south of Scotland. Um, hopefully the text on page 75 under the detail for project 31 perhaps makes that clear and, and covers the concerns that Councillor McComb has. But if not, we can look to clarify that text a bit further. So it does connect to Cairn Ryan. Shona? So I'm just I need to so I need to get my glasses on because you see the text is very small. Um, the text that's there, yes, talks about um, the relocation of the existing Stranraer station to and within the town and the creation of a new station, a new direct link for travellers between Stranraer and Cairn Ryan would include the provision of both passenger and freight to improve connectivity to the ports of Cairn Ryan. So whether Thanks. that provides yeah, enough. That, that's fairly clear, Shona. Uh, two or three other points. There is no mention of either the A714 or the A713. Now, recently, we have had a number of closures to the A77. Dry HGV drivers have been advised to go up into Ayrshire via the A76 and then come back down the coast road. That is an exceptionally long diversion. If there were improvements to the 714 and 713, a much shorter diversion could be in place. But these two roads are both missing from the map. OK, uh, Shona, on those couple of points, I mean, clearly those aren't trunk roads, so I think that that would be a matter for, for us as, an, as a roads authority in the first instance. But um, maybe you can clarify on that one. Yes, I'd agree with that, Chair, that I think what this document is really seeking to do is highlight the, the strategic actions. Um, and that's why it's focused, as you say, on, on the trunk roads. Um, I note the points Councillor McComb is making, but I think, as you say, that's perhaps one for us as a roads authority, rather than including that level of specific detail within this document. Thank you, Sean. I'd be inclined to agree with that. I think the objective has to be the... the uh making the A77 as robust as possible so that the diversionary routes are used as little as possible, uh, ideally, rather than us spending out on the diversionary routes. However, um, just uh, uh, thinking out loud. Jim, you want to come back? Yeah. The problem is, Chair, unfortunately, accidents do tend to happen and uh, you know, roads do get closed for periods of time. And we have no effective diversion route for the A77. A, another a road matter, a, a improvements between Dumfries and Galloway 
and the Scottish borders. Well, there is a shaded area on the map, but it not, does not actually specify which road would be considered for improvement. Okay, uh, Shona, can you clarify the, um, the, w w what's being thought about in terms of the, the link between the two authorities? Um, yeah, this is probably one that probably could benefit from some refinement. Um, I think that the report itself, as I say, acknowledges that this is only an indicative strategy yeah. and there are some projects in there that will require further work and further refinement. Um, and as we receive further guidance from the Scottish Government on how to do that, we will look to set up proper working groups with elected members um, round about that. So this one, I think, is particularly just a project to put down a marker, if you like. Um, and it's one that, as I say, we will we will look to develop further with, with Scottish borders and our elected members and stakeholders and relevant partners as well. Thanks very much, Shona. Thank okay, you. Thanks for that. So this this is very much not the end of the process so far as this is concerned. I, I hope that's uh, helpful reassurance. Um, Councillor Drybra, I've got you next. Archie? <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much, Chairman. I, uh, I'm really pleased that Shona said it was an indicative regional spatial strategy. It's not actually a regional spatial strategy. And uh, I'm pleased that Jim McComb raised the issues of roads. And I think, importantly, the development of the timber transport network is also, which is within the report, we need to look at as well. Now, it wouldn't it be right without me taking the place of Doogie Campbell for one minute and talking about um, the issues with regard that Malcolm talked about in the environmental issues. Uh, can I make a suggestion to you that it would be important if members did the carbon literacy training, which uh, myself and Doogie completed last week, um, and it shows how these improvements can actually help the regional spatial strategy as well. It's also part of my action plan to try and influence members to do that training as well. So looking, looking at the whole report, it's a good report. It is an indicative one. I'm um, happy to agree the recommendations, Chair, but I would also like to suggest to members if they want to do the carbon literacy training, then they do that as well. Thank you, Councillor Driver. I think it's really, uh, a really useful point. Actually, certainly I, for one, would be interested uh, in that. Um, so I'm sure we can have a look with officers at how that could be made available to uh, members, uh, clearly more, more, more widely than um, the, the, the original working group. Um, I have Councillor Scobie next. Willie. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> and I think in, in many of the pages, uh, particularly 67 and again on 73, there's reference being made to the A75 and A77. On page 67, I think it would be worth it to, to note, as far as the main settlement in the west of the Dumfries and Galloway and location makes it a gateway to Ireland, Europe and the rest of Scotland. The UK. I think we should make reference to the central belt of Scotland because it is an important gateway in that sense, uh, bringing in the A77 to the markets and there's a tremendous amount of jobs at stake uh, in the central belt and in Ireland, north and south, to that. And I think we should make reference to that. Reference has been made to the rail, which I'm pleased to note. Uh, as Jim said, to highlight, we do need that connection, connectivity between Cairn Ryan and Stranraer Rail Station, and then the, the, the rail improved. And likewise, there's reference to the Stranraer Dumfries line or, or route there. Just on page 72 and 73, comparing the two, and it's on page 73, it refers to dual the A1 trunk or complete the A1 uh, 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 as a dual carriageway, a trunk road. I think it would be better if we had that paragraph repeated in uh, page uh, twin point or 22 on page 72, uh, what and, and why, uh, because it does go in line with our objective and our uh, lobbying strategy to have the, both the 77 and the 75 dueled. So rather than just look for improvements, I would hope that we would look for a dueling over the next uh, 10 to 20 years, uh, that of a programme, uh, uh, and to, to build that in, so that we're not just looking for the, the improvements, 
as we fear might be the case from the STRP2, uh, but rather we're looking beyond and, and part of our whole uh, lobbying strategy to, to have both roads. Uh, and Jim's correct, uh, of I think the 252 uh, road closures on both the A77 and the A75, 204 were uh, identified against the A77, which is a much higher number. And when that does happen, they tend to go the 714, which is totally uh, not fit for purpose for the, the, the vehicles uh, when there's a uh, detour, when, when, when the, 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 uh, there's any road accident on the 77. And many just can't travel it because of the high-sided vehicles. So they even go further away, further than Castle Douglas, sometimes even onto the 74. So I think we need to highlight that we do need the, the 77 and the 75, and it would be good to repeat that paragraph up in the uh, 22, the point 22. Okay, thank you, Willie. Um, Shona, would that be possible if, um, if members are content with it? Yes, if members are content with that change, we can, um, we can make that change to the document. I think, as, as Councillor Scobie said, I mean, a lot of the text we get in here reflects what's in STPR2 and various transport studies, but if members are happy for that change, we will we will make it. OK, certainly I'll keep an eye on the chat, but it appears members in the room are certainly in agreement. Um, I'll move on for the time being. Uh, Ivor, I'll have you next. Thank you, Chair. I always think some of these strategies are sort of contradictory whereby on one hand we want better links via road. So we're actually encouraging people to go onto the road and drive to wherever their destination is. And on the other hand, we're wanting better rail links, um, uh, which is to try and get people off the roads to go onto the trains. Um, so I find that difficult to balance. Um, personal view is if you could get freight onto trains and get them to where it needs to be, it might be a better idea, whether that's the return of the dumfries Stranraer line uh, extension of rails along there might be something we need to look at. But setting that aside, one of the other things I always think, when we look at the seven stains uh, in these documents, it's always around about Innerleithen and the, bo the border side. And I think we've got two or three really good quality uh, parts of the seven stains in our area. And I don't think we maximise that enough in any of the strategies that we do. Now, whether it's because that's been agreed that inner lethal will be the focus and then the rest comes off it. But I think, you know, like so in my own ward, we've got the, the A. There's a good track at maybe. Um, I remember when the Olympics was it the Olympic or Commonwealth Games were on, you know, we thought we should have the actual downhill uh, cycling at the A because it's the best course in Scotland, I'm led to believe, and it didn't need to actually be built. It was there already. So I think we should be looking to try and get a wee bit more on those sort of things, sh share a wee bit of the success in or lethal to other areas. Thanks, Ivor. I think you, you know, two, two very good points. We do have to get to, to the point where we prioritise some of this because there is probably enough in here to eat up the entire um, transport capital budget for Scotland. Um, if it were all to be done, well, never mind simultaneously, if you were to do it over a single parliamentary term. So we, need, we do need to look at um, the, the things we pitch for first and what the strategic need is. doesn't mean that they're, they're not necessary or worthy, but you've, you've, you've got to make a start on the things that you can, you can deliver. Um, or that you can argue um, to be delivered for you. Uh, I hope that's maybe something that we work through when we get to the, um, the full spatial strategy. Um, I suspect that there's more work will be needed on that. Um, this is the indicative. We've got to get it in by the 18th. So, you know, it's a starter for 10, and I think that's, that's absolutely fine, and it's a good piece of work in that regard. But I take your point. I think it's a very good one. Um, Obviously, I live in Dalbiti. I am particularly fond of um, our own uh, uh, Seven Stains um, uh, 
uh, route, although I walk it because I'm not really very keen on mountain biking, but um, it is a really good asset, and I think I, I take your point. We should absolutely make more of it. Um, I, uh, I, I fully agree with that. Um, Sean, I don't know if there's anything that we can do in terms of, you know, maybe just reflecting that in um, in, in the, the relevant text. Um, yeah, I think I, I, I get the point that well, Councillor Hislop's making. So there's quite a bit of feedback there. Um, I think that the inner My Leithen apologies, Mountain that was me. Centre, uh, I was going to say that the Inner Leithen Mountain Biking Centre is listed as a specific project because that reflects Scottish Borders Council Borderlands project. Um, I don't know if there'd be scope within any of the specific projects to make reference to our own seven stains. We can take that away and have a look at it. But certainly on page 62, when we're talking about the economy theme, we do reference right at the end of that table about the ability to promote the south of Scotland as an outdoor recreation destination in the UK. Um, so we've got the hook in there. Um, we will certainly take, as I say, those comments away and have a look at the specific projects where there is an opportunity to make mention in there of our own Seven Stains network. Okay, I think that would be really helpful. I mean, if the hook's in there, that's what's most important because I think it's a fair point that this is work in progress um, and we'll, we'll refine it when we're doing the full um, uh, regional spatial strategy, no doubt about that. Um, however, I have Councillor Hagman and then I think we'll go to the recommendations. Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, this, I just wanted to come in on this particular point because the seven stains is one that I talk about regularly. Um, prior to being a councillor, when I actually had time for recreation, um, I was a keen mountain biker. I still hope to be in the future when I get the chance um, to do. And actually, my understanding is Scottish Government have earmarked specifically funding for seven stains out with the Innovation Bike Centre and that was part of the condition because actually Scottish Government have put more money into the Borderlands deal than the UK Government and that was part of the funding. So that is actually down as a specific project and I would be keen to see that reflected in this because that has been identified as a as a way forward because clearly the Seven Stains is hugely important to Dumfries and Galloway. Thank you. And thank you, Katie. I'll just bring Lorna in on that point. Lorna? Just to confirm that Seven Stains is one of the Borderlands destination projects, and that's one of the business cases it will come forward to members in due course in the next uh, month or so, um, working with Forestry and Land Scotland. So um, that does cut across both borders and our destinations within um, Dumfries and Galloway. So Councillor Hagman's correct in that. So um, hopefully Shona can reflect that particular project in the text of the, the narrative and reflect that too. Okay, um, so grateful to Katie for the reminder, and I think that, that will be positive if we can include that, um, that, uh, that will fulfil that point. Uh, keen then to go to the recommendations members, just checking for any other indications, either in the room or online. Okay, uh, so can we at 2.1 um, agree the South of Scotland indicative regional spatial strategy as detailed in the appendix and clearly subject to the couple of comments that have been made uh, uh, during the course of the debate? Are we content with that? At 2.2, can we note next steps for the submission of the strategy to the Scottish Government by 18th September, uh, as set out in paragraph 3.3.1? Okay. And at 2.3, authorise the Head of Economy and Development to make minor changes to the document prior to its submission to the Scottish Government. And we're content with that, I take it. Okay, it appears that we are. Um, I'd be keen to make a little further progress before we break for lunch, so I'm conscious that we don't want to spend too much time in the room without opportunity to ventilate, etc. The room, that is. Um, but we'll move swiftly on uh, for the time being. Um, thank you, uh, Shona and David. Um, we'll move on to item six, which is uh, the Assessor and Electoral Registration Officer Business Plan End of Year Performance Report for 2019-2020 report by the Assessor and Electoral Registration Officer. This report provides elected members with um, the assessment of the delivery of the Assessor's business plan for the service in 2019-20. Uh, the report also includes more detailed information on the service risk register and health and safety performance. 
the report summarises the key achievements in the past year um, and the service performance at tables one and two of the report. Uh, Jim Doig is here via Teams to respond to any questions members may have on the report. Jim, is there anything that you'd like to add to this before we go to questions? Yes, very briefly. Uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, good afternoon, members. Uh, just on a mission there, I'd just like to highlight on page 12 of Appendix 1, there's a performance indicator target missing there. Apologies for that. Um, under Section 7, that should be 96.4% under the health and safety audits. So, other than that, happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you for that, Jim. I'll go straight to members' questions and comments. Councillor Hislop, over. How confident, uh, with the additional time that you've got on, was it the first uh, reform of the annual canvas, that it will go without any issues when it is implemented? I note that you're able to take extra time to quality assure. So are you confident everything will go well? Thank you, Ivor. Jim? Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Hislop. Yeah, yes, we've, we've done quite a bit of preparatory work on the, the, the canvas. It's, it's quite a new system this year. Uh, the delay has given us a, a bit extra time. Um, in terms of assurance, uh, there's a couple of things. Uh, feedback from other EROs across Scotland so far uh, in terms of the reformed canvas is such that the, the, the workload coming back is significantly reduced because of, of the new process. Uh, and secondly, the, the republication date of the register has been postponed until uh, February instead of December. So it gives us additional time. So I'm quite confident we'll, we'll complete the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, I have Councillor Hagman next. Katie. Thanks again, Chair. Um, yeah, it's just a quick question. I'm aware that in... I believe, I think it was, it came to full council, we had agreed that we would go out and do a consultation on our polling places. And there was all sorts of information there about how many people use these very rural um, places to cast their votes. And I'm just wondering, I appreciate that this is, this is a, a report on what the past activity and the performance, etc. But I was just wondering if it would be appropriate to give an update on where we are in terms of that particular work stream. Thank you, Katie. Jim, can you assist with that, please? Yeah, well, well that piece of work is really the, the, the responsibility of the returning officer rather than myself, and I know that work is going on with that, so perhaps it's uh, prudent that the, we, we get back with the report because I don't have that level of detail. OK, thanks, Jim. So I'm sure that can be um, directed to the returning officer, um, who, who I should imagine has quite a lot to worry about in terms of what elections may look like. Uh, next year as they may be rather different to uh, how they've looked in the past but um, if uh, Katie if you're happy to, to take things forward by that method I'll just see if there are any other yes, members thank you Chair thank you Katie um, check whether there are any other members indicating okay thank you we'll go in that case to the recommendations um, so we've been asked at 2.1 to review at 2.2 to scrutinise and at 2.3, are we content to agree the proposed amendments to the current business plan measures as detailed in Appendix 3? I'll take it that we are. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. We'll move on then to item 7, uh, which is the People and Transformation Business Plan End of Year Performance Report for 2019-20, report by Head of People and Transformation. Uh, this report provides uh, members with uh, the assessment of the delivery of the People and Transformation Business Plan for the service in 2019-20. The report also provides more detailed information on the service risk register and health and safety performance. The report summarises the key achievements in the past year and summarises service performance at tables 1 and 2 in the report. Michael Shepley and Heather Carnahan are here by teams to respond to any questions members have on the report. Um, Mike, Heather, is there anything that you'd like to add before we go to questions? Um, oh, thank you, Chair. Only, um, obviously, that I acknowledge uh, comments that have been made previously with regards to um, resource requirements and the adoption of new ways of working, um, and obviously ensuring that we cover um, any skills gaps that are identified as we go forward. Um, obviously, one of our key aims in supporting post-COVID is to ensure that we have 
um, the uh, uh, opportunity to build the correct level of capability and capacity to assist all the service areas in being able to deliver post-COVID. Um, and on that, I'd be happy to, or we'd be happy to take any questions on the report. Thank you, Mike. I'll go straight to members' questions and comments. Councillor Hislop, over. Chair, it's on uh, PDRs, one that comes across quite a lot. Um, you've managed to achieve a yellow triangle. Uh, a lot of the other se services are red. I can't remember if it's octagons or hexagons. Um, what have you done to achieve that? And can you spread that out across the other services, the, the work that you do, so that we can actually get more of these within acceptable standards across the council? Thank you, um, Mike. Okay. Um, obviously, um, the data there relates to um, uh, before I joined the uh, the council. But what I will say going forward is obviously what we are looking at is um, is a revised um, performance management framework, one whereby we will uh, work across the services to encourage. Uh, more conversations between um, line managers and their teams um, and, and again, more strength-based conversations that will inevitably link into, uh, directly link into the completion of, of PDRs and, and obviously the, the focus is going to be around uh, enhancing the leadership capability um, and sharing best practice um, identified across the services as well so that we, we have um, greater strength-based communications um, for the purposes of um, improving the employee experience and improve service levels uh, across the council. Thank you, Mike. Ivor, do you want to come back? Nope, content with that. Okay, uh, so I have Councillor Johnson next. Malcolm. Uh, and then thank Councilor you, Chair. Scott. It's actually page three of appendix one, which is page 109 of the, the document down at the bottom. We've got percentage of successful visits to the council website. Right. A wee bit of clarity as to what constitutes a successful visit. And I know it's within target, but there's been a deterioration from 70.57% to 63.69. We've only got a target of 53% of visits being successful. And clearly with uh, everything that's happened in the last few months, I would have thought digital engagement with the council would have been would have been a priority. So, could you explain to me what constitutes successful? Okay, it's within target. I think maybe the target's not quite ambitious enough, and why is it deteriorated? Thank you, Malcolm. Um, Mike, Heather, which you would like to take that on, please? Um, it, it, I, I agree the target uh, does need does need strengthening, um, and, and in respect, um, I would have to look further into that um, with the communication team. Obviously, um, in the absence of the, the previous manager of, of that function, um, but I would certainly look to to offer a, a more detailed and uh, comprehensive reply um, away from this away from this committee meeting, if I'm allowed to do so. So uh, I think that would be helpful, but I see the director would like to, to come in. Lorna? To, to be helpful, um, the, the visits um, and the feedback in the visits is based on the visitors themselves completing survey. So you're prompted to ask, did you get what you needed and, and other questions. Um, but these are figures up to the end of March. We know there's been substantial increase both in terms of activity and use of our uh, online services or, or, or media services. Um, and indeed social media engagement as well. So I think it would be helpful in terms of bringing back some reporting around digital that we, we bring, bring that back to you, Malcolm. So if, if that would be helpful, Malcolm, I do take the point that the reporting period will, will only really cover the start of the, the big shift that there's clearly been from, um, from, from all the methods of accessing our services to predominantly online that, that had to take place in lockdown. But I think uh, more detail on that, I think, would be beneficial for members. Um, so we'll move on for the time being to Councillor Scobie, Willie. Thank you, Chair. I'm looking at page 115. And the risk here is not managing our resources effectively to meet the expectations reflected in business plan commitments, and that's across the board, I presume. 
and then it goes on risk factors, and it's the second one, balancing a, redu a, a reducing workforce with increased demands. Now I'm not sure if you know taking like for instance social work, whether we're seeing a reduced workforce, but what we are seeing is an increased demand on the services post lockdown, uh, and that has been reported to the social work committee. Uh, but one of our pillars is that we would be uh, put priority to vulnerable people. And I just wonder if we're able to balance that demand against the resources that are available. Uh, that I refer here to the demand being put by the service users uh, and still reflecting that in a balanced budget, uh, whether there's an eye being kept on that. And also, you know, the ones that were now identifying that didn't use the service before doesn't mean that they weren't there uh, pre-lockdown uh, or pre-COVID, uh, but the demands may be greater. And it's how we match up to those demands and whether that's, that there is a close eye being kept on the, the, the demands with people coming from lockdown suffer more mental health problems and so forth and so on, whether that, that there's a close eye being kept or not. Okay. Thank you, Willie. Um, Mike, Heather, would you like to take that one, please? I think the, uh, the immediate response is, is yes, there is a close eye being kept on that, as there are with, with all the service areas and the requirements uh, post lockdown. Obviously, um, we are keen through um, people and transformation to ensure that we support the service areas um, in terms of ensuring that we recruit um, strong, uh, high caliber candidates um, and that we can also retain those in the business. And therefore, we will we work, we continue to work with the service areas, um, not just in regards to recruitment and building capability, but also building a, a high degree of resilience. Um, obviously, the workforce planning um, is primarily directed by the head of service in a particular area, or in this case, um, the chief social worker and her team. But um, quite um, quite obvious to myself is that we retain a good relationship with all the service areas that we can therefore uh, better understand their um, operational issues and can offer the appropriate advice and tools um, to close any, any gaps or deal with any uh, identified risk factors. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, I have Councillor Thompson next. Stephen. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, it's actually following up on the point about successful visits to the Council website, and I think there's maybe an opportunity here to, uh, as has been touched on already, maybe to sort of um, refine what we're actually measuring there a little bit better, because now when I use the Council website, which I do regularly, um, there's actually support dg.dumgal, which was in response to the COVID uh, situation, which I think has been well used, but is that now considered a separate website. So we're measuring two things. Uh, there's, there's also other aspects about um, how we measure the success of something. So I think my instinct would be to exit the survey pop-up boxes as soon as possible because they're very irritating uh, and actually interfere with the user experience. Uh, but actually you could measure things like transactional uh, completions of things like how many times did somebody search for planning applications or when did somebody lodge a, a consultation response or did somebody um, report a pothole or did somebody report a street? I mean, there's so many things you could measure to actually gauge what people are using the site for and how often and how, how well um, that I think we're missing a huge opportunity here and have been. So I think now's the time to really sort of dig into that and maybe get a better um, sense of how our digital infrastructure and our digital public facing presence is being used to the max. Okay, and I think it's a very helpful comment, Stephen. Um, Mike, Heather, do you want to take that one up, please? Uh, yes, I, I, I agree entirely with the, uh, the sentiment of the comment there. Um, one of the pieces of work that we have uh, currently commenced with is to look at the, um, the, the whole digital um, 
performance improvement framework, uh, moving from one of just merely collecting uh, data for data's sake, but actually one of um, uh, implementation and embed a business intelligence framework whereby we will collect data and um, better analyze that data to assist both officers and elected members to make better informed decisions under the umbrella of business intelligence. Um, and quite clearly, um, what Councillor Thompson refers to there is very much in scope of, of that work over the next couple of months. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, I now have Councillor McClelland. Henry? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if I'm being a, a wee bit sick here, but um, page 111 on the gender pay gap. If we look at last year, the status was a green tick for a value of 5.68 against a target of 5. And this year, we've got a value of 3.96 against the target of 5, and we've still got a green tick. So I'm kind of struggling with what the what the value actually means. Could you maybe give me just a wee bit of explanation on what this KPI actually means? OK, thanks for that, Henry. Um, can we assist with that, please? Uh, I'm afraid this is going to be a baptism by fire in terms of uh, this committee chair um, and reporting on to it. Um, that is a point that I clearly um, have missed um, and will need to come back to, um, the, to answer the question um, more respectfully and, uh, and, and fully as would be uh, expected. Okay, so if, if we can get a chance to look into that, and you can circulate the members of the committee once you once you have the information, that I think would be would be fine. Okay, so if there are no other members indicating that they wish to speak, we'll move to the recommendations. Uh, so at uh, two point one, we're asked to review the uh, performance uh, for the People and Transformation Business Plan, which we have done, and at two point two, to agree the proposed amendments to uh, the current business plan measures as set out in Appendix Two. Are we content to agree that? I take it that we are. Thank you, members. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, oh, sorry, Mike, have you got your hand up? <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm slightly confused in wishing to do a good job on my first in our committee. Um, the value is correct in the sense that um, we, um, it, it is actually the 2018-2019 um, value. The, the gender pay gap should be uh, closing and therefore the direction of travel between 2018-19 to 2019-20, um, one would expect that to um, uh, go in that direction. Um, it is probably the, uh, the value 5.68 against the target previously of 5% that is wrong, but certainly one would expect um, the uh, through the work that is being done for the value to continue to decrease as, it's, as it is showing there to 3.96 as we look to close the gender pay gap. Um, so therefore, in terms of uh, my understanding there, the figures we present um, is that 2019-20 um, is correct. It is the previous year that was reported incorrect. Right. Okay. Um, so I, I think I, th I think that certainly assists. Um, I see Councillor Driver wants to speak. We we had very nearly finished this item, but Archie, yeah. carry on. Uh, apologies, Chair. I want to I want to sort of bring in uh, Mike up to date on that particular thing. When you look at the gender pay gap for last year, it was right. Um, this year, we've actually reduced the pay gap, the gender pay gap. So therefore, the information in the um, the, the the table is correct in that it was, you know, 5% last year, and this year it's 36 Um So therefore, the information isn't wrong. It's, it's correct at, the, at that particular time. It means we're, we're improving on the gender pay gap side of things. Okay, th thanks for the clarification, Archie. Much appreciated. I think as long as that continues to, to, to narrow, that's, that's the direction we need to be headed in, without a doubt. Okay, thank you, members. Um, I'm keen to see if we can uh, fit in another uh, report. Uh, before we break. Um, so thank you, Mike and Heather. We'll move to item eight, which is uh, the economy and development business plan, uh, end of year performance report for 2019-2020, report by head of economy and development. 
Uh, this report um, provides members with uh, assessment of the delivery of the economy and development business plan for the service in 2019-20. Um, the report also includes more detailed information on the service risk register and the health and safety performance. The report summarises the key achievements in the past year and service performance at tables one and two of the report. Um, and my notes say that Steve Rogers is here, but I see Gillian instead. Um, but Steve Rogers should be here as well, am I right? He is, he is, excellent. Yes, the, uh, yes, the, 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 the tech is keeping me... Uh, understood. The tech is keeping me guessing, but I am getting, I'm getting slightly more accustomed to it as we go along. So you're both here um, to respond to any questions members have on the report. Um, is there anything that you would like to add before we go to questions? Uh, no, Chair, nothing to add, thanks. Excellent, okay. In that case, uh, we'll go straight to members' questions and comments. Um, and I have, I think I have uh, Councillor Dryber followed by Councillor McClelland. Archie? Thanks very much, Chair. Just a, a, a question, a clarification, especially in the table at 3.2 with regards to total financial pressure at 2.9. We did receive a report at full council um, last time about the full financial pressures or the financial pressures being £2.9 million. Um, so therefore, there's a, there's a bit of you know, clarity that I need to make sure that the total financial pressure is 2.9 for the um, department rather than the full full council. Archie, are you on item nine by any chance? I think, I think possibly. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Chair, my mistake. <clears throat> Not to worry. Um, I'll maybe see if we can fit that one in before lunch as well, but I, I don't want uh, to be, be over-enthusiastic. I do, however, have Councillor McClelland, if it's on item eight, Henry. Yes, it is an item eight, Chair. Um, Steve, page 47, appendix two, it's the KPI that relates to the post-work inspections. And we've got a number there at 10%. I, I understand, obviously, re, uh, issues regarding software and methods of working, but that 10% inspection, that represents one in 10 jobs being inspected um, post-work which would obviously means nine out of 10 aren't being inspected post works. Now, we've had a recent history where on larger projects, a number of these um, snags in the numbers of thousands have actually appeared. Are you concerned that this one in 10 ratio being so low and the implications going forward that that might bring? I'm just wondering if you're comfortable with that one in 10. Thanks, Henry. Steve? <coughs> Chair, yes. Um, certainly, we're looking to uh, put in place significant improvements in this area. Um, uh, this is part of the, the whole restructure of um, uh, property and estates and facilities management that we've been undertaking over uh, the last 12 months. And Clark of Works capacity is absolutely something that we are um, increasing at the moment. Um, and as we roll out the new structure, um, that will put us in a much better position uh, to ensure that um, those works are being picked up and, and inspected as, as we go. So um, to directly answer the question, no, I'm not comfortable with it, but we are, um, we are on it and we are uh, addressing that capacity issue. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I have Councillor Scobie next, followed by... Councillor Johnson. Willie? Yeah, it's pleasing to know Archie can get his uh, item agenda wrong when he accused me of getting the wrong day, so that's a wee bit of pleasure, Archie, there. Uh, 24 hours, Willie. <laughs> Touché. Uh, just on, uh, I'm pleased to note you on the exceptional report, Steve, that uh, the sickness or, or reasons for sickness perhaps isn't it down to entirely stress. There's no reference to stress there, but still the days are high. Uh, maybe you could respond to that. But looking at page 44, in terms of customer satisfaction rating from building standards, and from 2017, uh, it's remained relatively static, with a, just an increase on 2019-20 in terms of satisfaction. But it's just on the improvement actions, and it refers to consider the, cap the capacity of level available 
expertise in building standards to ensure its capability of delivering the required quality of services. And if you've heard me speak of this, it's in terms of that everything is not centralised, that we have people out in uh, the other areas, particularly in Stranra, that is capable of doing uh, building standards to get to people who, who require the service. And I wonder if you could just comment on that. And similarly to the previous page on page 43, we're looking at percentage of completion certificates responded to within 10 working days. And that one is relatively low, uh, reflecting six day. 3.22%, uh, and whether we're keeping up to performance on that, uh, recognising that these are coming to customer satisfaction. Okay. Thank you, Willie. Steve, can you assist with these, please? Yes, Chair. Um, certainly through you. Um, these two um, performance measures uh, and, and exception reports really reflect some of the issues that we experienced in the building standards service um, over the last 18 months or so, and which have been subject to uh, previous reports to uh, both the EI committee and to um, this committee. Um, we are in the process of uh, implementing the action plan and the 40 recommendations that were uh, agreed um, back in May of, uh, of last year uh, as a result of that um, external review. In terms of whether the um, service is, is centralised or, or decentralised, certainly for the last six months we've been um, delivering anything but a centralised service, and I expect those ways of working will, 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 will continue um, with uh, agile working and much more home-based working and with staff supported by technology to enable them to do that. Uh, all of the inspectors and surveyors uh, now have um, mobile devices which connect to our back office system which has made um, the, the use of their time a lot more efficient, and, and that certainly is something that, that is going to continue. <clears throat> the customer satisfaction rating um, does reflect some of the uh, issues and ch challenges that we've had in, in building standards. And as part of that, um, going back to the previous um, performance measure about um, Completion certificates, uh, that that measure has been directly impacted by our need to reprioritize staff time onto uh, one of our other measures, which is responding to building warrants within 20 working days, which is absolutely which was absolutely critical in terms of the Scottish government's monitoring of our performance and their ability to reaward us with a, a verification uh, contract. So um, that um, reprioritization uh, turned out to be effective in that um, we did manage to improve that particular performance measure to the extent that the government issued us with a new um, three-year um, agreement uh, just at the end, uh, just at the tail end of 2019. Um, so that means that we are now able to, um, with that, certainty of having that three-year agreement in place, we're able to reprioritize our resources and, and ensure that we're, we're now addressing the, the completion issues, the, the completion certificates more clearly, which I understand the performance on those has picked up uh, more recently. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Willie, do you yeah, want to come back? Yeah, I'm pleased to hear what Steve's saying, and, and, and hopefully, you know, from the agile working, working from home, will reflect in future reporting uh, that the services are improving. So I'm pleased to hear Steve uh, say that, and that if there's any recruitment, it's to the place where they're required. Thank you, uh, thank you, Willie. So I have Councillor Johnson next. Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean. Uh, Planning, uh, building control, these sort of things are all going to be very important. Again, we're building the economy going forward. Um, so there's a couple of quick questions. The establishment of the inquiry team to handle inward investment, 
how is that progressing and the transfer away from us to south of Scotland Enterprise? And as a result of that, is there going to be a delay while the, the transfer goes ahead? Are we going to be in limbo for a period of time where nothing seems to be happening? There's a, I've got a concern about that. The old chestnut as well that uh, Councillor Hislop brought up as well, the annual reviews, again, we don't seem to be getting anywhere with that. How confident are you that that is going to be dealt with by this time next year? And also, in the current market, do you think the £500,000 capital receipts is an attainable figure going forward? Thank you, Malcolm. Steve? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, with regard to uh, inward investment um, handling, um, we had certainly made progress with that, which I think is reflected uh, in the in the progress uh, project progress bar there at the top. However, um, as you as you rightly point out, we now have a, a dedicated um, economic agency for the south of Scotland. And we have had some initial conversations with them about the prospect of setting up a, a dedicated South of Scotland um, Inward Investment Office or Inward Investment Bureau. Um, we continue informally to um, handle inward investment inquiries and, and to liaise uh, informally with our new colleagues in South of Scotland Enterprise. Um, so that work uh, does continue. Uh, and we'll, we will continue to have an important role to play in terms of um, supporting inward investment inquiries because of the links that we have into some of our key statutory processes. You mentioned planning. Um, that's one. Um, we've also got links into, obviously, with, uh, with roads and with the, the likes of environmental health. And these are all key um, players in terms of providing that support to uh, inward investment. So, We'll, we'll have an, an ongoing role in this, but it will, it will look different because it will be, it will be a partnership vehicle, I expect, in uh, in future years. With regard to um, PDRs, yes, there has been some um, slight delay in the in the full rollout of PDRs, um, but I think we also have to read this performance measure uh, in the context of of the other relevant performance measures that, that deal with staff and in particular um, staff, uh, staff morale and staff understanding of their role. And I think there are two other um, performance indicators on, uh, on page 22, uh, which, which show very positively uh, in terms of people having a good understanding of, of what's expected of them and what their role is in delivering council priorities. Um, so, Whilst, yes, there is a process issue in terms of PDRs, I, I, I don't have concerns that that's impacting uh, on, on staff uh, morale and approach. Um, I think that covers all of um, Councillor Johnson's queries. Apologies Thanks, Steve. I Malcolm? Missed anything there, Malcolm? Now, it also asked about the, you know, the current climate, whether it's realistic to expect a £500,000 in capital receipts. But with the inward investment point, my point, my real concern was that we were going to go into a state of limbo. So I've got an element of reassurance that this work is still continuing until the new organisation is, is properly up and running. Because I, th I think if we had missed six, nine, twelve months while we were busy trying to set up a new organisation. I think it could have been less than helpful. Uh, the annual annual reviews, uh, I, I know it's just a box ticket exercise, particularly you, as you, you're pointing out here, it's a box ticket exercise anyway, and that you've got other indicators. So that raises the question about uh, uh, how valuable you view these things. But anyway, we'll move on from that. So. Uh, whether you think the capital receipts of 500,000 are still attainable. Okay, Steve, if you can help on that one. Yeah, I'll certainly come back to that. Um, I, I should also point out that um, I don't regard it as a, as a box ticking exercise. I think the PDRs are important. I was um, really trying to put it into context of, of other PIs and, and how, as, as a management 
as a management team, um, we review these PIs um, across the piece. So yes, in terms of capital receipts, I think we're we're confident that that's a that's a reasonable target to um, to set, and we'll, we'll keep that under review. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, I have Councillor Thompson next. Stephen. Uh, thanks again, Chair. Yeah, so it was just um, a question on the derelict property strategy, uh, page thirty-seven. I think it is sitting at ten percent. Um, while, uh, well, firstly, I mean, this has already been put back from uh, an original start date of uh, 1st of December 2018, um, and then it was actually started on 4th of January 2019, due date 31st of March 2020, which would have been a good week or two after the onset of the COVID lockdowns. But I think that's where I'm reading the, the improvement action, and it really makes a play of the outbreak of COVID-19 as impacting on, the, on that deadline there. And I'm if you're sitting at 10% with a week to go, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't scan very well. So I'm just sort of, um, and it's, I'm sure there are a number of elected members in the room and, and not in the room who ha have long been concerned about how we address as communities or as a council derelict properties um, across the region. And I'm sure there's a few headliners in every ward, but uh, yeah, so I, I'm not convinced or I'm not particularly assured by that particular uh, uh, reason been given as, as the outbreak of COVID-19. However, I do accept that obviously we have to go and forward review just how the whole uh, looking at property fits in with how we deal with what, how we come out of the COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. Um, so I accept that, but I, I, I don't think it's acceptable to give that as a reason. I'm just wondering if there's maybe a bit more, uh, a bit more robust uh, rationale for, um, for why that hasn't been pursued, because clearly that's been a good couple of years or so um, and I, I don't know if, if there's a, a will lacking amongst the me elected members, because um, it certainly comes out in community meetings that I'm at, or if there's a, uh, an issue getting any progress in this within the existing team. Okay, thanks, can, I, can, can I just say, but before I, I sort of conclude that question, but I, I'm glad that um, Councillor McClellan raised the issue about the Clarker Works uh, target, because we often hear about the do it once, do it well, but how do you know you've done it well? Oh, well, you have to check it, don't you? So. I think it's, and I accept that there is a recruitment issue about that. And going forward, we will be um, we will be able to to measure that and improve that, which is good. But again, it's down to compliance and just checking that we've done stuff right. So I think that's a move in the right direction. So I'm glad that's been highlighted as well. Thank you, Stephen. Steve. Chair, yeah, yes. Um, just in response to Councillor Thompson. Uh, I I think the the picture is um, more complex than is painted uh, in the um, improvement action that's that's in front of you there. In that um, there are significant other areas of of work um, that have been prioritised, particularly in terms of our um, response to the uh, town centres capital fund that was that, that was announced. Um, and we've sought to use of those funds um, together with the, the Town Centre Living Fund. And, and there's a report um, coming up shortly uh, on this agenda in terms of the Town Centre Living Fund and the way that that um, contributes to addressing uh, issues of um, problematic properties, particularly within our town centres. So without wishing to um, labour the any um, excuses, I think the, the whole situation has moved on considerably since since, since this um, notion of a derelict property st strategy was first aired and I, th I think the, the the focus has very much been on the more dynamic actions of, of trying to access some of those new funding streams which weren't around um, when when this action w was first developed and I suspect it will be one that we review as part of um, next year's business plan to make sure that it's, it's better articulated. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. Steve. Thank you, Steve. Stephen, do you want to come back on that? You can tell. No, I'll have to settle for that. I think it's just really to flag that I don't think you get to say COVID-19 is the excuse for that. I think that's really my point. Um, but aside from that, I appreciate it's a complex issue um, and hopefully we'll, we'll hear more about that later on this agenda. Okay, so I will move on. Um, I have... Councillor Carruthers, followed by Councillor Tate. Ian? Thank you, Chair. 
So my questions have been asked already about a lot of make some points, please if you don't mind. So plan and building standards been covered by Councillor, I think it's Johnson Thompson and McLeod in particular, the clerk of works the, the late inspections and levels. So a couple of points, Steve, I think for future reports, and it's something the council should consider. There isn't a line of tra uh, trajectory. We're having a, a, an improvement action. We don't see how that's got an impact. When I read this, uh, I was disappointed in regards to the information that's here, but at the same time, I did think, OK, uh, is this particular department being underfunded? Does the council need to look at its, its priorities and potentially reprioritise when it, when it comes to its, uh, its, what say, its main local priorities compared to its, say, how, how these link into its number one priority, which is building the local economy? But... And just on the side, because there's a lot to be said about planning and the building standards at the moment in, in regards to their performing, uh, but certainly perceptions, probably more on building standards, that's been touched on, the, the improvement actions have been there, there's been a plan went well over a year ago now, and we've looked at that and seen what's got to come forward, but it used to be a strong argument to say, listen, this this, this uh, department under-recovers by quite a considerable amount, the amount of money we're spending it compared to what we actually recover in, in, uh, in income. What is that like now in up-to-date positioning that? My understanding that it over-recovers by a considerable amount. So, some comments in there, Chair, but I would like to think certainly with the, 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 the trajectory in particular, and the level in funds to actually make this what's needed in, in regards to resource, make a uh, planet building stands in particular a department that's fit for purpose and shining like it used to be. Uh, it was the best in the UK. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Steve, any observations on that before we move on? Chair, yeah, certainly, if there are um, further improvements, then th that will be reflected in our um, review of the business plan. And, and uh, I think, as um, Councillor Carruthers uh, was maybe indicating there, there's a, a need for us to absolutely focus um, and we'll be uh, certainly looking at that as part of the review of the business plan itself. Um, I'd like to think that, that some areas of the service, the, the performance um, has continued at, at, uh, at a high level. Uh, and um, I think that's reflected, for example, in the um, planning performance report that, that we've submitted to the Scottish Government covering um, financial year 1920, where we recorded an improvement in our turnaround times against uh, all three categories of uh, planning application, which I think um, due recognition uh, is, is, is due to the, the staff. Within those three, within those teams, uh, who have um, really worked extremely hard to continue to improve our performance, and I think that there, there are other examples um, similar to that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I now have Councillor Tate, followed by Councillor Hagman. Uh, Ronnie. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just a question on numbers, actually. Um, I'd like, Steve, if you could clarify the number of building standards officers that cover D&G from Stranraer to Langham, and also the number of surveyors that do the same thing from Stranraer to Langham. Um, and I think I think the level of services is reflected by numbers, actually. So I'd be interested to see just how many, how many building standards officers we have and surveyors we have covering the whole area in Dumfries and Galway, please. Thank you, Ronnie. Steve, can you assist with that, please? <clears throat> Apologies, Chair. Uh, I was having a, a problem with uh, Teams there. Um, I don't have that information to hand, but we can certainly circulate that information in terms of the um, the current staff uh, within building standards and also the, the the proposed staff within the new structure that I referred to earlier. Okay, thank you, Steve. If you could circulate that to the committee, I think that would be that would be helpful. Okay, I have Councillor Hagman next, and then I think we'll go to the recommendations. Katie. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's a subject I'm going to see if I can, well, I'm not trying to. It's something that I've talked already about, the food and drink strategy. So we've got it in our improvement um, projects on page 12. Now, it's, um, it's got a green arrow, a green mark there to say that we're on track. However, 
as I've previously pointed out, we've missed the first 28 of those targets within that. Now, I appreciate the reasons for that, and it's not to question that we should have hit those targets because clearly we are, you know, we have been faced by COVID and that there is a, you know, that has its Im implications. However, I don't understand why that status is sitting at green when, in my view, it should be sitting at orange with either a warning or check progress. We've missed the deadlines of 28 of those targets. So why is it sitting at that project's fine and good to go? Um, the other point I had, and it's maybe something um, that I've missed, and I would maybe appreciate if I could be sent the information later, under improvement projects, we've got the review of the council's industrial portfolio. Um, and that started back in January 19. Now we've only completed 10% of that, but again, we've got a we've got a green tick on that, so we're we're good to go. I appreciate we've got until the 20, 2023 to complete that, but if I could possibly even be sent a link to that report because I, I can't seem to find it on the council website at all. And my third and final point is on page 34. Um, we've got under the service shall audit and review our health and safety arrangements. Now we've we've done a hundred percent of our of our audits and that's great to know. Um, underneath there is some more information about incident information, but I'm just wondering, is that audit report going to be reported to audit risk and scrutiny? Because clearly if audits are being done, where is that then being reported to? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Katie. Um, Steve, can you take those points please? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Chair. So, um, first of those points in relation to the food and drink strategy, um, I think this is probably down to the way in which that improvement project is defined. So, the project is actually production of a regional food and food strategy action plan. So, those have been produced and were produced within that time frame which is why it is now shown as green. So I think the issue that Councillor Hagman is, is raising is about the ongoing implementation and delivery of that, which we will keep under review and include in our future reports on the um, economic recovery plan. The second point in relation to the review of the industrial property portfolio, that is continuing and it, it will be completed uh, within the time scale, and I'll arrange for Councillor Hagman to be sent the link to, to that report that's referenced. And finally, the um, health and safety uh, audits, um, if they are reported uh, as a matter of course um, to the, the um, Risk and Scrutiny Committee, then the, the, they would be included in that. I don't know if they are included as a as a matter of course it's something i'll take up with my um colleagues in uh, corporate health and safety steve thanks for that i'll bring the director in on that last point lorna thank you chair um, in terms of the industrial portfolio item 11 has um, an update around the business infrastructure review as part of borderlands which also includes some of the industrial portfolio reviews so there's some information there that members may wish to to address um, in terms of health and safety arrangements, the Audit Risk and Scrutiny Committee, Councillor Carruthers, I'm sure will um, support me in this, receive regular reports on health and safety across the Council, including the audit issues that are addressed there. Okay, thank you, Lorna. So, members, we'll move to uh, the recommendations. At 2.1, we're asked to review the performance uh, for the Economy and Development Business Plan. Um, for the period 1st April 2019 to 31st March 2020, which we have done. Uh, at 2.2, we're asked to review the exception reports listed at Appendix 2, which we have also done. At 2.3, can we agree the proposed amendments to um, performance information for the Economy and Development Business Plan uh, as detailed in Appendix 3? I take it we are all agreed on that. Um, so we have got my hand raised. Uh, Ian, yeah, the, the hand raised is sometimes difficult to catch. Um, okay, I, I see you now. Carry on. I know there was certainly a discussion uh, in our group this morning in regards to the, and as you mentioned of it uh, today with the derelict properties, whether it should be changing that or not. So I think it's certainly for, up for debate whether it should be, because that's what we're getting in the appendix, is my understanding. Yeah. 
So, Ian, are you proposing a, a change to the recommendations? I think, as we discussed in the group as well, that we'd actually leave that one. We'd, we'd leave, leave that one. We, we do think it's important, going back to the economy, how things move on, uh, and what's happening. And the state, going back to what Councillor Thompson mentioned earlier, I didn't revisit that, but that's every community meeting you go to. It's the derelict buildings, the derelict state, uh, state of repair, the town centres in particular, is often mentioned. Uh, it's within identified plans and we, we in, in which we should be improving them. So I don't know if we should be changing that. But I would like to, the committee, I mean, I think it's right we shouldn't. But I'd uh, like to see what the committee's thinking. Okay, so you're proposing um, that we that we don't agree that specific uh, item is detailed in Appendix 3. That's the final box, if I understand it correctly. Which is the extension of the due date. Am I right? Yes, Chair. Okay, so um, I'm in members' hands with that one. That's a proposal. Um, Councillor Thompson? Yeah, Chair. I mean, while my concern was more about how we explain the narrative of why we've not done something, I'd, you know, I wouldn't want to make a virtue out of neglect and then sort of say, well, there's an opportunity here to dovetail this into a wider strategy post-COVID. The problem is we don't know when the COVID-19 pandemic will really end. I don't know if it's how wise it is to um, set a very early due date, but clearly it needs to be done. Um, but I mean, I've no issue with what's presented before us as it stands. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't really see the need to amend that. I think it's more, this is a, a reflection on what's all, what has gone before and it's how that's reported and how we then want to take that forward, but the, the actions presented for going forward, I don't have an issue with. So I, I'm not minded to change any of the of those recommendations. But I, I, I mean, I take the view that we can't have a, a, a review date, which is now in the past. You know, clearly, that does need to be changed um, uh, to to some extent. Um, so I think uh, you know, it's either a question of um, an earlier review date, or we stick with 31st March 2022. I take your point, Stephen. I think that um, we don't know, you know, how long COVID is going to last. So, um, you know, it would seem to me to be perfectly reasonable to stay with uh, uh, the, the change that has been um, recommended, um, and I'm quite happy to move that if uh, if that is required. I don't think that members are going to stop being interested in this. I have to say, uh, I think that's I think that's very clear from the debate that we've had. Um, so, I'm happy to move. Um, uh, that we agree 2.3 as outlined in the appendix. Um, I don't know if I have a seconder for that, or indeed if anyone else, Stephen's in, indicating that he wishes to second that. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, is there an amendment to that? Chairman, I'm quite happy to come in, not to put an amendment, but I thought it would, would have been ambitious of, of the committee to say, okay, bring it forward to March 21. Uh, put, just put that time on it. I know, I know we're going through COVID, but with, with the comments that were certainly made through the meeting, I thought it was appropriate we make sure that the officers are aware of uh, the importance across the whole of the region that this actually is to us, but I'm not going to be overly precious about it, Chairman. OK, thank you, Ian. So in that case, we'll agree 2.3 and Appendix 3 as it stands. Um, that's approaching, well, it's between 10 past and quarter past one. Uh, we'll break um, for uh, half an hour. Um, back to recommence no later than 1.45. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>